Welcome everyone, we are now live with To Aru Podcast number 23. And today we are going to talk about Item Volume 2. This has been a long time coming, I'm sorry. I read the volume a few weeks after it was initially translated by JSO6. Shout outs to them. Thank you for translating this volume, as always. But not everyone else were so willing to read it. But finally, I have gathered two people who have. So, welcome Malcolm as always, and we have Matrix, who is a newcomer on the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So, hello everyone, my name is Matrix, and as probably most of the people don't really have an idea of who I am, I am one of the mods in Aeon Server, and also I'm currently involved in two fan projects in the Tuaru community. The first being Tuaru Mugen, and the second being the Tuaru Imaginary Fest fan dub. I am the PR manager for both those projects. It just sort of happened, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And then I am also voicing Fiamma in the fan dub. Woo! And I think that's about it. Let's go. As for my story of how I got into the Tuaru, do you want the short version or the long version? We'll keep it short because we'll talk about items. Yeah, we have a whole so, book. Yeah. Yep. So if I'm really to just short it, every, short everything down, I got, I unknowingly got into the Toru franchise by being introduced to when I was actually looking up anime because at the time I didn't really know what anime was. I had seen a few clips and I was interested, so I looked it up on YouTube. And this was, I think, around the starting of 2020. I got into this series by what the Accelerator anime. <laughs> I like the character very much. And then I proceed to forget about the entire <laughs> season. So fast forward to around the start of May 2021, I was watching a lot of anime. And then I just discovered Index. And I was like, okay, this seems interesting. I read the synopsis. No, 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 okay, now I remember. It was actually Railgun that I discovered first. I watched season one of that, and I was like, okay, this is extremely good. And then I also saw A Certain Magical Index. Wait, these two titles sound similar. So I looked it up, and I was like, oh, so it's the whole last franchise. All right. And, yeah, after watch, literally binging everything in under two weeks, I read the novels in two months, literally all the main novels, side stories oh. and most of the parody stories and now i'm here because i was upset with the franchise and i still am to this day that's about it the first person i've heard getting into the franchise from the accelerator anime at least as a starting Ooh. point hey, yep unknowingly <laughs> because i didn't even know the rest of the franchise even existed at that point I guess, like, compared to the other two, Accelerator's somewhat the most, like, st standalone, I guess, of the anime, because it doesn't cross over as much with Mainline. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's crazy you managed to actually read all the novels in two months. I don't know how you did that. It took me, like, six months I mean... to go to NT15, when that was the latest volume that was out at the time. Yeah, that's crazy. I think my record's like 24 novels. Not like of Index, just light novels in a month. I mean, when that you table. consider what my timetable at the time was, I basically just woke up, did my toiletries, read, ate, read, went to sleep, and repeat for 8 to 10 hours a day because I read for 8 to 10 hours a day by reading everything out loud. I was just insanely obsessed with the series, and I did this for two months straight. Yeah, I think you can see why I finished all the main novel side stories that quick. It's a lot of people who need that energy in this fandom. Yeah, I can say something of that same, but still, it you need a lot of time and actually need to be interested in the series. Definitely. And it was during lockdown, which is why this was even possible for me, by the way. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So, Still. anyways, moving on to the volume. Yes, I was just General about to say, thought. though. I was just about to say, though, 
like hearing you getting into it because of the accelerator anime that's not the weirdest one i've heard uh, i think it's seven eves on twitter oh, who got into it the because the, yeah no 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 it wasn't oh. dojin it was it was uh not not origairu orimo it was the orimo crossover novel that they got into it i uh... think <laughs> which is absolutely oh, crazy well, I was... I... yeah <laughs> i just oh, wanted to I share that this. I have one other fan that I know on Discord in your server that they got into the franchise because of the Idol No Accelerator manga. Well, Legit. that's pretty based. <laughs> that's the best. <laughs> based. <laughs> they were in the Japanese fandom for a, I mean, fandom for a game they played. It was like a Japanese mobile game, and they had been in the fandom for like years, and years, years and years on end. And they suddenly just discovered the manga and read it in Japanese. And then from there, they have gotten into the franchise. That's cool. It is quite interesting hearing about everyone's different stories, how to get into it, because it doesn't seem like everyone just watches like Index Season 1 or Railgun Season 1. It always seems to be nowadays, I guess, because it's not airing that people mm. get into it from obscure directions and everything uh i think it's pretty fascinating but anyhow we will continue with our thoughts on item volume two as i said before this has been a while so my memory on it isn't perfect but i'm sure you two will have a uh, better notes and recollection than me nevertheless we can talk briefly about item one that i know we did talk about it a while ago on the podcast and i also did a video on it so if anything i'm just curious matrix what did you think of item volume one and what were your expectations coming into this one hmm, from as as for my expectations i have to say i didn't really expect much because i mean this is like after it was announced. This is like way later. I discovered. Wait, there's a there's a dark side spinoff of item. Wait, what? <laughs> then I quickly check it out, and I literally just had no expectations because I was too busy reading. To be fair, if that makes sense, and I was just greatly surprised. To be honest, I think item volume one was the best it could have been to start mm. off this entire spinoff. In my opinion, and there were many great twists and turns throughout the way, just in Volume One, that just surprised me, especially the ending. I was just like, "Yeah, perfect." I have got nothing else to say. The ending yeah. was really good. Yeah, I think that's something we agreed on in the last podcast. Absolutely. Uh, what were your expectations for Item Two, Malcolm? If any. Um. <laughs> I sort of had lower expectations for it. I didn't think... I guess... That's not even true. I didn't really have expectations for it. I yeah. sort of didn't really know what direction Kamachi would go in. Because I felt like it would have been... With how the last one ended... I didn't have the strongest opinion of the first book. Um, I think mm. I gave it a lower score than you did. <laughs> in the last <laughs> podcast. Um... Like, it was good. It wasn't, like, great. It wasn't bad. It was just good, in my opinion. So I sort of had, like, oh. it could just be good. It could be a little worse. It could be better for this one. And I think the first half was definitely a lot better than the first book. Um, Because, like, my big thing with the first book was I thought the first half was just super boring. Um, and then it's picked up in the second half, whereas this book sort of had the opposite effect. Um, so, I don't know, I, I am satisfied with the book. That was, right. yeah, I didn't really have an expectation, but it was satisfactory, ultimately. Right. Well, we can agree to disagree. I thought it was a really strong start to the 
the item series. Obviously, we weren't too sure if it'd be a standalone or a continuation at that point, but it is a series ultimately. And I thought it was the best it could have been for a first volume. I thought it was last. And I even enjoyed the slice of life start, uh, stuff in, in the fir uh, first half, yeah. With <laughs> Mugano jogging. That was highlight. <laughs> Mugano doing slice of life stuff is just to me. But anyway, uh, we can possibly talk about our overall thoughts, maybe, about item two, or we can say that for later, or we can just like go through each part of it, like prologue, chapter one, chapter two, and so on. Yeah, I think we can just yeah. save, yeah. Save yeah, our thoughts through till it. last. Yeah. 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 Alright, yeah. let's start with the prologue then. So, it's immediately throwing us into action as there's this obscure chase sequence between the item girls and this dark are they a dark side organization i guess they are mutual acquaintance yeah. it was uh, it, yeah be like a cleaner group for famous people or something or not like a yeah cleaner, it was like a hit it group. is a entity uh it's a dark side organization responsible for basically fulfilling requests and taking out the trash in all of the entertainment industry so for example if like a, a actor accidentally kills their like by accident kills their assistant or something and just some incidents like those in the entertainment industry they take care of that stuff and they actually operate because they are a stunt agency so that actually gives them some like uh, some abilities to actually uh intervene in this sort of stuff from what i gather mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, not much. Yeah, Mugino is just obsessed at the moment in the prologue, being the big bad wolf. That was a nice little thing I liked. Oh yeah, I forgot about that motif. <laughs> he seems the jetpack the stuff was weird. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say <laughs> that. Like the jetpack stuff. Oh, like, were you able to visualize these like mini jet boosters? Because. I wasn't. I tried so hard because they were like, it used like weather balloons and like, well, I think Frinda built them. I guess Frinda's yeah. just their full on event inventor, not just for bombs, but just like in general. Um, <laughs> I was trying to, like, I just could not visualize Mugino on a weather balloon jetpack. It just seemed too goofy to, <laughs> unless like, <laughs> Unless there's like some different kind of weather balloon that Kamachi was basing this off of. But I can only think of the giant, you know, weather balloons you see on TV and stuff. Yeah. I just think it was kind of weird um. how they were able to move about and stuff. And I, I don't know why, because Frenda, why hasn't Frenda like introduced this technology? In like the present, if she can like yeah. do other shit apart from bombs. Yeah, I mean it puts like it really like builds up her as like this inventor throughout the book. Yeah. And I was just like reading, I was like, when did this happen? Where was this in the <laughs> first book? Or ever again? Oh yeah. Like I just I thought she was a explosives expert, not just like Oh, by the way, I've created a pin that shoots lasers out of it. Just like like a James Bond inventor or something. Yeah, it feels like she was like NT21 Alistair inventing right? like random shit <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> yeah, she... Like, later down in the book, she's talking to Kenhara and she literally says, Oh yeah, this is just an antimatter bomb. I'm like, what the f... Yeah. Oh, that turned out to be a like, prank. Well, that... technology. What the hell? That that was a prank, though. No. That that wasn't real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It actually troll. got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I initially believed it as well because I wasn't 100 percent <laughs> sure, considering what Kimachi is like. But yeah, <laughs> I guess that was a a troll tease. I did think that surely that would be like way too overpowered. Or, or yeah, they would have, same, right? like, 
Yeah, Acad Academy City would have used that Academy somehow. Academy City's dark side is like gonna allow you to hold, like hold that kind of weapon, you know, have it in your possession. Like yeah, Alistair's yeah. gonna be watching. That. There's no way. Yeah, it was very. I don't know. This was just. It was a really weird opening that was a lot more convoluted. Like it really was just there to set up the fact that they had jetpacks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the only Pretty reason much. this whole sequence existed. Introduce the characters and show that they have jetpacks now. And then like I know they're oh, help and then to murder their victims. By the way, there's <laughs> gonna be death in this book. Cute girls will die. <laughs> Killing off idols just like Oshinoko. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's... I that's thought the, the same thing. thing. I thought the exact same thing while I was reading it. Wait, is, the, is that the Oshinoko title that Megino just got <laughs> in the gut? I was imagining the same thing. I was laughing so hard when I was reading that. Oh my god. But I have to say, like, about the overall volume, there is one thing I've noticed in the first one and this one as well. The characterization for, like, all four of the item girls feels different, doesn't it? It feels like, uh, compared to the main series, they feel way more characterized, if that's the word. Am I making sense? I get where you're coming from. One of my main complaints from the first book was I felt like Mugino was a bit too, like, power of friendship-ish. Um, <laughs> compared to like where the modern books sort of like, or where she was like introduced in the modern books, you know, um, mm. with Battle Royale, um, they felt a lot more close knit than I feel like they should have felt as like both a dark, like a, a dark side group and like for like the types of the trails they'll go through later. Um, and I've, I, with the current book, I sort of, I'm slightly feeling more confident in Kamachi, like what direction he's going in with it. Um, mm. like, I can say the it, same. yeah, th this book did increase my percep or like it did improve my perception of the first book based off how, where he's going with the characterization, particularly at the end. Hmm. Yeah, I brought up that point just to say, like, this feels different from, like, the main nine novel books, but I'm not saying it as a complaint. I'm, I meant it more as a compliment, like, how much he's able to do, like, this stuff, and also have it make sense at the same time. And I think that's one of Kamachi's great points. Like, he hmm. can write a backstory arc, but still have it makes sense when he's kind of from your perspective writing it semi out of character if yeah. you know what i mean yeah exactly i think he's just living and... out every japanese artist or japanese writer's dream of just getting to write the cute girls doing cute things stuff <laughs> but with murder but evil <laughs> yeah but evil but evil i mean characters like um kinuhata are a lot more gray like really set up more gray in the yeah by evil i probably just mean willing to murder yeah. other people <laughs> yeah <laughs> though they do push oh. the idea that in particularly in this book that mugino doesn't want to or their item is very conscious about involving randos hmm yeah I suppose it makes sense because then it involves like the non dark side people and they don't want that. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, um, say Kakine, like he doesn't care if like a bunch of innocents get killed on a yeah. mission. Just he, he has no like negative feelings towards it. It won't affect how he sleeps. But it seems like even Mugino was like morally against letting innocents die at this point mm. like Not they the have a very clear villain. moral compass 
There's different there ranks of villain. There was also people in the book multiple times. Oh, sorry to talk over you, Eon. Nah, nah, that's cool. Cool. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, like, it was stated multiple times in the book, at least from what I remember, more so in the latter half of the book, that dark side members, like dark side people, shouldn't involve the light side people. And it also happened the same with Frenda, like when she was interacting. Like, it's just a... And it makes me appreciate the dark side more. Like, they're not mm -hmm. someone who just have no morals and just go around killing people for, like, their selfish, like, purely selfish evil deeds. They have unspoken rules in the dark side and, you know, things that, that they are meant to follow. It's not just that... Oh yeah, it's you can basically do any thing you want. You're still you still have to follow a certain moral code yeah. even if you are in the dark side. I do think a lot of those rules are more so self-preservation though for a lot of dark side cuz like if you do too much, eventually the light will notice and the dark can't exist in the light, that kind of thing. Yeah, there need uh, yeah, there needs to be balance. Yeah. If they want to sustain themselves. Balance in the force. Yeah, yin and yang. It will be interesting but, to see this prologue in the manga, though, when you can actually you know, see what's going on, if they are actually turning us into an adaptation as opposed to something else entirely. Nevertheless, they have a bit of a twist in terms of who the target actually was. It turned out to be the client who was cute idol girl and they kill her by melting her inside yeah nice yeah the idol girl apparently had something to do with like she was it an ngo like someone was selling homemade cupcakes for like some yeah NGO for like a really really good cause and the idol the idol just stole those cupcakes away <laughs> and someone else like someone else who saw her she basically killed him killed her it, it was one of her uh, her j idol mates like one of the people in her idol group so she hired the cleaners or this group to kill her i don't ah. know if mugino and co like prevented that or if that just already happened i don't think it really specified like if that idol friend is alive or not but it doesn't really matter yeah it was just a good it was just setting up a plot twist and actually now i just noticed something but you know the idol who just has the angelic smile and just appears it feels in in line with the theme of the volume being like scam and deception because the idol with her smile is like really oh, deceptive yeah. that's true actually so I yeah. thought so I thought that was a good nod to, like, the overall theme in the volume as well. Hmm. That's a good point. That's it up well. What's to come? And then, yeah, between the lines, we get... I think this is from Caroline. Caroline, however you would say it in Japanese. <laughs> I'll just call her Carol, because it's easier for me. I think this is from their perspective of going through each of the item members. Kind of yeah. like what he did in the... The prologue of the first volume in a way mm. but this is mm. all from their perspective so again it just introduces the members in case you don't know them yeah mm. and then yeah also just one thing i wanted to just one more thing that i wanted to mention from the prologue so yeah. they got apparently the they have their like i think kinohara was in trouble because her jetpack like was malfunctioning and they dropped down into district 19 yeah i think it was district 19 and they go into a shop because some of the mutual acquaintance guys was there and then <laughs> lo and behold there's kanwa shinka is it kanwa shinka i think it was like you know the character right yeah yeah, yeah. i think it was so that was, was a cool reference i was like oh i didn't expect him to be here that was a cool reference cool little reference and he's will Frenda's little sister, and they're talking about Mariho brothers. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, so yes, Mario yes. Brothers. I remember now. Yes, 
I, I honestly thought that was vault, uh, chapter one. <laughs> so I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't the only one. Uh, well, yeah, it is the prologue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great to see Kanu in this, actually, because I was curious if he would actually show up, because I do, I do really like his character, actually, because I'm a huge NT12 yeah. stan. I mean, <laughs> well, um, it feels I like, him. like, uh, Kamachi like set him up, and then never like, oh look, he has this relationship with like Brenda's little sister and stuff, and then just sort of it never really paid off into anything. So I'm or like paid off into anything to their past. I just feel like I'm hoping we see something more related to that in book three. I'd like to see him in book three. Absolutely, mm. it'd be great to see more on his relationship with both Frenda and Fremaya. Yeah. It definitely well we, we kind of know a bit about their relationship from the present yeah. that was it the present or the room that Frenda had stashed away um, or Kanu. Yeah. Or, it just wasn't we fleshed it. out as much as I think yeah. some people would yeah. like to see from him. Yeah, absolutely. But I am glad that he is a thing and we might get to see yeah. <laughs> kamaba as well or uh, does, does kamaba get like a little brief cameo in this volume i, th I think or is, is i thought imagine? he did yeah i feel yeah. like he did yeah i think it was on the phone or something like that yeah it's been too long oh yeah and, uh, and just one <laughs> i was laughing at this line so frenda apparently because they were failing to you know quickly defeat the enemy and they actually let the enemy escape because Kinohara's jetpack malfunctioned. So, <laughs> Frenda got scared when Mugino, and she said, like, eh, in the end, that means she's going to tie up our redacted with redacted, cover our redacted with grated yams, drag us onto the high level balcony where there's no escape, and spell all day redacting us like that. It itches more than it hurts, but it's still hell on earth. It's like, what the fuck? Yeah, legit. <laughs> so Legit. What was with the what was with the censored words in this volume? Like, because this happens again later on, and I'm like, what it sounds so sauce. What does she mean? S spend all day effing us like this that? Whole what the, what was, the fuck's going on? This whole what the fuck's volume going on? Was, uh, so like, who knows? Ma Malcolm, come uh, on. Like, uh, who, who, wait, uh, who knows Japanese here? Someone read that shit. Well, okay, and explain well, to me what, 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 what does it mean? I don't see the Japanese text. Who knows well, how it was said in Japanese? Oh, have Is you? he implied? Like, I don't even want to imagine what it's implying. Like, because <laughs> he's going to tie up our censored with censored, cover our censored with grated yams, drag us out high level balcony where there's no escape, and spend <laughs> all day censoring us like that. It itches more than it hurts, but it's still hell enough. Like, <laughs> we'll just let the Japanese doujin writers decide what it Is meant. That is that a kinky torture? Uh, can you imagine it being yeah. anything else? I mean, yeah, I, well, I would I hope... Mugino's attempt to let out her inner sadist. I would hope Mugino doesn't involve, <laughs> involve herself with degeneracy like that. <laughs> Considering these these <laughs> item girls are meant to be a close you know, unit. Uh, yeah, no. Well, Kamachi has well, just now they're just really back. close. <laughs> okay, because I swear there's another instance of that later on where it's like, it sounds really fucking sauce. I think it's like, is it chapter three or four? Anyway, I think I'll try and keep notes. Yeah, I don't remember. And, yeah. Is is that everything from the prologue? Mm, yep. Let me just take a quick look. Yeah, that, this is my fault. Yeah, that's that about this everything. Ah, good. Because this is yeah, my fault for not writing this... notes. Well, in-depth notes. And nah, it's wow. fine. Anyways, wow. they go hey, 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 I did, I did write notes. I did. I just didn't write them in depth. Not, especially not for the prologue. It's like a fucking prologue. <laughs> Come on. Jeez, I, I worked so hard writing notes for this podcast. Hey, and here you are. Hey. Listen. Uh... Listen here. I run two jobs. I got this. I've got my full-time job. I, I need to make like three videos a week. I try to. Usually don't, but I try. 
Give me some slack. Nah, no excuse. Just quit. Quit your jobs. I would quit my Become job, YouTuber. but I can't. Right. <laughs> Only fans. I mean, I said like you could, but I, I probably w wouldn't be able to survive. <laughs> well, I mean, nah, you're British. Y'all can survive off like whatever y'all eat. So like, you can survive whatever's <laughs> in the trash. Mate, I'm not gonna oh. live in a cardboard box behind Tesco eating out the fucking bin. Uh, I mean, that'd be better than what you currently eat, probably. Do not insult British food. Listen, I bet you've never even been to Britain. You've never been to England. Thank goodness. Shut it. Shut it. You, you, just, you just read so many of Kamachi's books and you fall for the same shitty stereotype. Show some respect. Without British food, you, your food over there in the States won't even exist. Fucking hamburgers are fucking invented by Germany. Do have that? Well, no, nah, just the hamburger steak, but fucking... we were the ones who put the buns, so, you know, we oh, fixed it. Oh, wow. We made it you put better. fucking bread on it, made a sandwich. Guess yeah. who made the fucking yeah, sandwich? This is a, this Earl is of Sandwich in Britain. Who, Earl of Sandwich is fucking like, British, mate. Fish and chips. Well, you didn't invent fried fish or french fries, but you just put them on a plate together, and you're like, this is British cuisine. You mean how do you invent cooking a fucking fish because fried fish guess where that came from the modern version that y'all use for your fried fish was germany yeah well fucking saxons from germany invaded us after the romans so there we go dang this is just the skill issue <laughs> all right enough enough yeah well, time to just speed run past the prologue just some of the small detail though details i'll quickly mention from my notes it was stated in the volume that district 19 is intentionally left in the past that was an interesting little tidbit and homemade jetpacks that's park and what else yeah frenda just proceeded to flashbang her little sister and kind of kick on which i'm like oh well, all right then guess they have eye damage now <laughs> yeah I, I remember that uh, but we can't spend all day on the prologue. We gotta move on. So yep. we Chapter are one. yes, we are at the new item HQ as in the previous volume. The item HQ, which is in like this apartment, got absolutely nuked by fake item. So they own a new place, uh, but let's say that the new HQ doesn't last for long either, because uh, yeah. that you know, <laughs> reaches an unfortunate demise as well, coincidentally. And yeah, there's a typhoon in town, and the typhoon becomes a huge thing in the volume. It's referenced many times. Malcolm knows. Well. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, two of the things that were were on the TV, like in part one, the first line it says is like the you know the tournament that actually becomes important later down the line in the volume, and then the typhoon. Yes. Yeah. And I have just Kamachi... learned to pick up on this stuff Kamachi because of Kamachi. Also... Yeah, Kamachi also references global warming. Is is item <laughs> two his his point on global warming or people claiming to be global warming or everything's global warming when it's not actually not? So Kamachi's a conspiracy theorist. Kamachi comes off as pretty uh, libertarian at times. <laughs> Kamachi has a lot of like very interesting like leanings in some of his books that is uncommon for Japanese. I typically find like in the last GT book that I won't go into here because of spoilers yeah. for people. And who could forget Thomas <laughs> Thomas stands on abortion. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i'm i'm curious what's gonna happen to that line oh my whenever God. it gets uh officially localized i'm wondering if it's gonna if, get altered somehow if if they have the balls to adapt that i will commend them <laughs> simply not because i like am like pro-life or I anything just that, that because, <laughs> because it's just like so out of the blue <laughs> uh but we won't talk about oh serious shit like that <laughs> for the sake of the podcast uh, 
Yeah, there's uh, some interesting oh, no, stuff no. in this opener. Um, I, like whenever they come home, I think that's how it started, right? They come home and the dead guys just hanging from their balcony. Oh no no, uh, Takitsubo and Mugino are on like a train or something. They're coming, they're going home, and uh, up, it's going to rain. So Takitsubo is like, oh no, we left the balcony open or something. So Mugino just flexes modern technology and closes the balcony. And then Frenda mm. and Kinohara come up and they see the dead guy. So Frenda calls Mugino, uh, is this your friend or something? He's lying there on the balcony. And then part three just comes along. And this is where yes. some of the interesting stuff starts to pick up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so people who haven't read GT won't know who the hell this is yeah or who this right. person is related to but if you've read gt3 oh my lord when i saw this i was like because I, I didn't i didn't clock like the the oh, japanese wait, like, this... family name yeah. immediately but once, yeah. once i realized they were doing like that kind of stuff i was like oh my god and then the twins yeah, yeah i thought the same thing i didn't oh. pick up on it from the name alone and then she's like i'm my twin daughters and i was like twin daughters wait and then she's like, yeah, they're in the dark. Like, she just straight up just puts yeah. her family in the dark side. And I instantly knew, like, oh, my gosh. This is the Hana Hanatsuyu you know? mom, possibly dad. Possibly. <laughs> um, yeah, mom, dad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Matrix, have you only, did you not notice? I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Matrix didn't even realize. <laughs> And now that you pointed out, oh my god, this fog okay, this this just went up one point in my ratings. Oh my yes. holy. You need to go you need to go back and read this part. All right. <laughs> it's so funny, just with the knowledge of GT. Like, if you haven't read GT, you, it's like you yeah. aren't fully oh, experiencing yeah, how to build this book. I mean sorry, the thing she specializes in, yeah. Okay, this all of this makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she's the mama of those two in, from GT3. Well, then. possibly Dada, because yeah, possibly yeah. Dad. Because yeah, we'll, we'll oh, yeah, I'll try to explain. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try oh, to explain. Did I say it, so about being her mama. I'm oh, sorry, it's hard oh. to know. No, it's okay. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll try to explain it. Okay, so uh, th this this person we don't know who's uh, <laughs> male or female. Well, she she says that. We'll just call her she and, and call her mom because that's what she says she is. So we'll, we'll go with that. But mm -hmm. later say something else. So th this person, she like specializes in decomposing bodies essentially so that there is literally no trace whatsoever. And she does this all biologically. So she's got some like weird ass bugs and shit, I think. And they, yeah, yeah, it's a combination yeah. of like some bugs and also like a special type of bacteria that she uses. Yeah, and she is able to like complete like use these bugs or whatever to consume the entirety of the body with no trace remaining. Uh, and it's like really it's described like really gruesomely like how how this body is just mm -hmm. being like eaten and it's kind of like disturb disturbing and grossing out the item girls as they're watching it and she's like oh uh you you, you feel free to clean this room afterwards if you want but it won't like change anything or essentially something like that and uh she's she's so like knowledgeable and like in like in a scary ass way in terms of this like dark side of manipulating like cells and shit that she implied that she can actually alter her gender or sex I should say so she, so she like implies that she could be a guy like what she says whether I am that girl's papa or mama whether I supplied the sperm of the egg will remain a secret <laughs> like what the fuck. She said, there are yeah, certain like parasites. To... Sorry, there are certain parasites oh, no. and specific endocrine disruptors that can remove a human's male productive abilities and make them female. It's like, damn. It, this is. This was like really like eye opening to read. 
Yeah, in my notes, I just wrote down, I see, thanks for sharing. I, I, I just don't, I don't have anything else to say. Well then, the more you know, I guess. Why don't you give this a you... lot of thought? <laughs> Food for thought, I guess. Oh yeah, uh, she mentions that she, she wears the gas mask on the side of her head, like the like her twins as yeah. well. Uh, and apparently that was a, the DJ from the Colosseum from the previous volume who, who was wearing that as well. So that's got an interesting link. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but, but Malcolm, what did what did you think of this? I've talked about it a lot. Man, I just thought it was cool. Like, I don't know. I love callbacks. Like, I think I messaged you. Uh, mm. Or I messaged after reading, like, the first half, and I just mentioned how I really enjoyed all the callbacks at the... Or the mm. references, I guess, that the series was making to, like, yeah. build the world. I, I like how Index handles, like, interconnecting the world and all these characters. Hmm. What I like about it is that... Because... I know the murder twins in GT haven't been the most popular characters by any stretch, but with how fucked up and messed up their mum is or dad, like I can mm. totally understand now, like why her twins are the way they are. It makes perfect sense now, and it's not mm. something you really like take into account. You think, oh, these these murder twins possibly don't have like parents or the you know child errors like a lot of Dark Side people are but but now considering like just imagining what upbringing upbringing they've had and why they're like fucking experts in like decomposing and like biology and, and diseases and shit this makes perfect sense so i i really like her character and i hope to see her again in the future because i think she's i think she's yeah. like way more cool and interesting than twins i'm just like damn like i'm wondering about her backstory now i'm like how did how did the fuck did she point yeah, seeing her here, that that just gave me a new perspective on the murder twins. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, well exactly. then. Hmm. I literally have no words to say because Kamachi just has the ability to write some of the most twisted things I have read in like in such a seamless and natural way that I'm like, I commend you for like having a such a diverse style of writing, my Jesus. Absolutely. So I hope people in GT might have a, you know, cut some slack for the twins, maybe. I, I get that. I understand why people don't like them, but I never, well, I, I, I like the concepts behind their characters now. Yeah. I, mean, I always kind of did. I thought they were intentionally gross on purpose. So. Mm. Uh, moving on, we get a brief. I don't know whether to call it a cameo because she appears multiple times in the volume, just like not very frequently though. But voice on the phone, so we know the voice on the phone is Hanano from the previous volume, mm -hmm. and we do get a scene at the end or near the end with Hanano again, but in person. But yeah, we we do get her talking to the item girls, basically giving them their new job, and it is this organization called Honey Queen. Yep. yep. Who wants to go from here? Because I've talked a lot. Um, it's interesting seeing Hanano in this volume. I didn't think she would be like working so directly with Item after the last volume. I thought she'd sort of just take on a Overwatch kind of role. Um... And I think, I don't remember if it was in this chapter or the next one where she starts talking about um, how items sort of inspiring the creation of other four-man groups. Oh, yeah. Like items sort of like an experiment that's like a successful experiment that's leading to other four-man groups, which means you could trace back like the creation of school and stuff to item, which is interesting. Um... also thought that was really interesting so item was the first proof of concept that yeah. an organization like this can actually exist and 
basically be like controlling the dark side in a certain way. Like those who are too far removed from the dark side, like too dangerous for the dark side, like the antagonist in this volume, can be disposed of or controlled in a certain way, from what I gather. Um, so that was good to know. Yeah, to be honest, there's not... I don't really have a lot of opinions on what happens in this chapter until they accept the mission. Yeah. Like, yeah. mostly it's just, like, cool references and character building until they actually accept the mission, I think. Then all of a sudden we get thrown into the action. Yeah. Well, I have some notes to share. First of all, they're having a party in the balcony. <laughs> In their pajamas. Yeah. So they're like ramping in the balcony, camping in the balcony. Is just the new term that friend I found out about or something. Yeah, Mugino's just... uh, outfit's a bit sus in the illustration because there's clearly no, uh, there's nothing under it. Oh. Uh, yeah. I need to yeah, see look this at the again. illustration and look at her thigh. Yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Like, if you're in Frinda's position, just looking down at her, it's just you're getting the full view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see this as an, as an absolute win. <laughs> and also, Starzux is a thing. <laughs> Starzux, oh point, yeah. There's, feels... oh. there's like a Skype ripoff as well. <laughs> yeah, Skype. It's literally yeah. just Skype, but with a C. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't know that Kaji's just going to confirm all the apps and social media at this point. Yeah, there and, were like a couple more like references to companies, I think. Hmm. And we get to find out about a new machine. It's apparently oh, like something oh. to like drink from. It's like it stimulates all, all of your senses like the, your, the sense of your touch, your tongue, the t sense of your taste, and also your smell to give yeah. you any kind of taste you want from that machine through that straw. And because it's cold, so it's basically it can reproduce any... If you have a recipe in the machine, it can basically introduce... Like, what's the word I'm looking for? You can basically taste anything that's on the machine. And it works yeah. best for cold drinks. So that was like, all right, that's a nice little thing. Did they thing. end up doing uh... anything with that straw? I remember I kept mentioning it throughout the book. Like, Frindo would, like, take mm. a sip from it to calm down or something every now and then. But I don't remember it ever being, like, used for anything. No, that was just, just something that... Just something that was there, really. Nothing really came out of it. Yeah. I know, it's just a really weird addition. <laughs> Academy City. I, mean, I kind of expected that with the Academy City, yeah. 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 And so, now, time to move on to the spicy parts. Yeah, shall we just talk about what Honey Queen is? So. Like a marriage, yeah, a marriage scam. scam network, I guess. Um, I mean, it's pretty. It's basically they just gather dirt on people by scamming key figures. It wasn't really that mm. complicated, like. Yeah, it wasn't too important, I feel. I mean, obviously, like, the people behind it were important, but they had... Yeah. That wasn't their primary motive. That was just, like, basically to gather data, I guess. Yeah. Mm. It was, like, yeah, gather resources and data for money. And... I have to ask, though, uh, did any one of you think it was Sh Shokuho? Was it called Honey Queen? I feel like it was I like did a, think a red of herring. Shokoho right away. Yeah, like whenever they called it Honey Queen, and then later we see Shokoho. Um, yeah. I did like I was trying to connect dots, but like at the same time, like they weren't connecting. Like I could sense something was up, mm. but I could feel like 
Like, I had my doubts, you know? Yeah, because before the volume came out, when the, the preview, or not preview, the synopsis was first released, I was like, Shokuho doesn't seem like the person who would go online and, and scam, like, random people like that. <laughs> she doesn't come across as... Yeah, like though at the same so. time, it's like, oh, it's a year earlier, and who knows? Why can't you give Mugino that benefit of the doubt, then? <laughs> uh, I did. <laughs> All right. All right. So. The new apartment gets blown up. Kaboom. Again. <laughs> yep. That having Terma look at this kind of... rate. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, dang, this sounds like something. Like Toma joined well, item or something. Well, somehow... <laughs> yeah, they, they they noticed there was a bomb. They somehow reacted in time and had... I thought somebody they, like, were sh shot at by something. Like an RPG sort of thing or something. Oh, no, was the bomb, bomb was actually... Anything? Yeah, it yeah, was it was actually traveling down from the pipeline that was like, it had its outer, like, it has its exit into the balcony, so like, it just dropped down the pipe, and then came okay. out the bomb, so it just suddenly exploded. Okay, and then the jetpacks come back into play. Yeah, they yeah. somehow managed they, to they, they, have the jetpacks on at this convenient time. Yeah, so they just could... like at the, in, the, in the illustration, you know, they're all wearing the jetpacks while eating <laughs> together, you know. Yeah, because because they know the bomb's coming. So that's yeah. the problem on floor, the volume. Because <laughs> they did seem like... I did mention this in like my brief review on um, Twitter, that there was quite a few instances of plot convenience... That just seemed a bit jarring for me. I feel yeah. like item one didn't have that as much. It, it felt like Kamachi got to this point in the book when he was writing, and he's like, crap, I don't know how to get them safely down. Uh, I'll just go back to the beginning and give them jetpacks. <laughs> That's why they were in the prologue. <laughs> yep. So it didn't seem like an even bigger ass pull for when they have them on now. <laughs> uh. It was stated. Uh, how'd they get them? Uh, friend is an inventor. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Happens. It it's happens. Something. So right. now it's raining heavily. And now they're just floating a bit away Wait, from the so, building. You know what? Actually, the back to how they called their called uh, honey. Oh, crap! What was the organization Queen. called again? Queen. Honey Queen. Um, actually, the way this all started playing out, where it's like, oh, how'd they predict our every move? I did sort of think, well, I could imagine Shokaho being able to sort of predict out like this in a way like i think she's a good enough manipulator that she could read people and what they would do next so like part of that sort of made me think oh maybe shokaho is involved until we actually got the character reveal hmm. well turns out it was something else entirely yeah as they make their escape they basically go into is it one of their Cars and this funny item scrubs who <laughs> works for them. Basically, Hamazura before it was Hamazura, just some. Well, I don't think this guy even gets a name. He's just like random fodder who drives them around. <laughs> yeah. Well, he does become somewhat relevant because he he does go into hospital after this and do make a bit of a scene about it. Yeah, he, he sort of is used to establish. Um... He's sort of like a plot. He he basically exists specifically for them to like start explaining the power of uh, the Gyaru Loli. Yep. Ah yes, Carol, Caroline, Caroline. I read oh. it as Caroline. Yeah, Caroline. 
I don't think the Japanese will say Anami it like that. Caroline. Yeah. Well, well, Aeon, you don't pronounce Japanese properly. Well, with Western names, I will pronounce it how it's meant to be in the West. So screw you. Well, Eleanor are the same in Japanese, so... And she's got both right. of them in her name, so... Uh, yeah. Make of that as you will. Also, Mary, I think that's... What, what do you mean, Mary? In, in, in uh, Mary... What was her name? Mary... Mary... Tachiuo. 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 Mary. Tachiuo. Tachiuo. All right. <laughs> yep. Carol and Mary is a lot easier for me because I'm a fucking scrub who doesn't know Japanese. Or any other foreign language for that matter. <laughs> God, I'm so uneducated. Index is my education. Anyway. They basically get cornered by... Some guy is it guys working for them? They're like getting down. Yeah. Basically, um, it all plays according to Caroline's plans uh, all the way up to the... Basically, to what happens to Mugino, which I think was the biggest surprise of the volume. <laughs> One of the yeah. biggest shots of the volume. Yeah, because we, we get introduced to Carol, and she is 10 years old. And yet, she basically is the one who develops... Mugano's S for power. She is basically the Kihara Amata to Mugano, which is yeah. a bit wild considering her age. Uh, but we'll talk about more about that later because it gets six mounted upon. Yeah, just the one other thing that we really need to mention. She's also the one who developed the number six's power, which is just like, all right then. Yes. All right, Kamaji. I yeah. see you teasing him. I see you teasing him. Yeah, he's done that in these two volumes now, which is starting to make me think the whole point of the item series. Actually, that's what I put in my notes. Kamachi really wants to tease the number six. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if the real purpose of the item series is to start setting up the number six and all of his stuff for the main series. Because, like, the first series had him as a major plot point, and now this one is sort of setting him up. So I can't imagine him not being relevant in the third book. Or mm -hmm. well, maybe this is setting up uh, Ihana Etsu spinoff. Oh, let's go. And then it's... <laughs> then we only have <laughs> one level It'll just be minutes. like a... It'll just be like a silhouette on, like, the front cover. It'll just be like, you'll be able to see who it is. <laughs> That'll sell like hotcakes, I'm sure. <laughs> God, if that ever happens, that's gonna be so wild. But uh, I literally can't see it happening because it just so, it's so inconvenient. It'd be an interesting premise, though, like having a mystery story. Yeah, Almost. I mean, I, this book sort of sets up. <clears throat> uh, he's sort of like. I guess they set up in the last book too, but they further it in this book and how he specifically sort of keeps the dark side in check almost. It's really dark interesting. Dark side's bad. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But like to such a grand degree, it's sort of crazy. Like it really makes you want to know more about him. Like it makes me impatient. Yep. Yeah, the entire, literally the entire dark side is afraid of him because if he finds a target, he finds a villain. He's not going to stop until that villain is murdered. He will yeah. literally use anything necessary. And the other fact was, because a and Carolyn actually used some of the number six's power, because this comes later on in the volume, and it's revealed later on, she basically developed her own power. Like taking inspiration from, like taking some parts from Mugino's power and then some parts from the number sixes. So I was wondering, so Ayana Etsu can do the same thing. That was like something I wondered about while reading it. You know, the instant teleportation later on in the volume. 
his power is such a oddity. I it's so hard to say really what it even is. Like even with all the information we have. Um, yeah, like, there's two. We don't really know what it's capable of. We haven't really seen it. We've only heard it from Ihana's word. Uh, one one very important plot point um, that we start seeing in this uh, chapter. Uh, it's raining a lot. Um, and every single time the characters are outside, we're going to hear about oh, how gosh. you can see through their clothes. Yep. <laughs> oh, yep. Kamachi will make sure to mention it every couple paragraphs whenever they're fighting outside. It's literally the only reason he added the, the uh, typhoon, typhoon coming through. And the typhoon I mean, also represents the Typhoon also represents the time uh, of Harold's backstory as well. Yeah. But it also represents that the girls' clothes are see-through. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. He's too hungry. We need to bunk him. Uh, but I don't know. The craziest part of this, though, to me, well, like, other than the head researcher for Mugino was how easily they defeated Mugino and how she stayed down after the whole diesel explosion. Hmm. Yeah. I was like I was... legitimately surprised it was that easy for them to sort of just beat her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause we get introduced to Mary as well. Who's basically mm -hmm. <laughs> our subordinate basically like a a master and servant kind of relationship they have going although we learn more about their dynamic later on in the volume but it definitely does have that vibe to it yeah although mary their relationship like, yeah their relationship really reminded me of uh kiara hasu and ladybird in gt yeah that's what i yeah, thought I of whenever i was reading through it especially yeah. by the end hmm yeah, I didn't think of that initially, but when you mentioned it to me, I was like, damn, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Well, yeah, Mugano gets easily defeated. And we kind of find out why later on, once we learn about more about Carol's power. It's like a, like a form of precognition, I guess, where she can somewhat see into the future in a way. I forgot the name of the ability. I'm sure yeah, you guys will be uh... help, able to help me out on it. But yeah, so she can. So uh, well, well, there's there's no they fight again, obviously later on, but we kind of see how that can practically be used in the fight, along with some other like. I think she uses like illusion shit as well. To, photography. But so yeah, yeah, in conjunction with it, which makes which her, we like, saw. I think that was also in Railgun with that one boy. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah. comes under the same category of po power. And because, like, she's the one who developed Magino's power, it's electric-based. It's electric based. Yeah, electricity-based form of photography. It's apparently only level one. Yes. Because, yeah, she's and only that level was one. The biggest... yeah. And I think that was part of the reason they had, or Kamachi decided to, like, do the young genius approach was because he needed her to be not an adult in order to give her an esper ability um since yes. that's something that's been he has been hinting at so much but we still know like no nothing about adult espers yeah or if they can even exist to begin with yeah i mean it it seems pretty clear that they can't but who knows like the most i don't know i'm really curious what happens like the, what the second like Makoto or Accelerator turn 18, do they just stop being espers? Like, I want to know how that works. Yeah, it is interesting. We finally get, like, a scientist or researcher who's actually an esper. I'm not counting, like, Gensei or Kiyama, because yeah. they basically took, <laughs> took the esper powers, or gained Cheated. esper powers from the multi-skill, yeah, yeah, from the other espers that they had in comas. 
<laughs> uh, so I'm not counting them. So this is an actual yeah. scientist who is an Esper, which is interesting. Because I, I did see yeah. someone mention that, like, in a community post or something. Like, I wonder when we'll we'll get to see that. And I'm like, have you read Item lately? <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't have a clue, I don't think. But yeah. So they're kind of a mystery, although we get a few hints about them. Carol calls Mugano a failure. She, she's not really happy with how Mugano turned out, which is kind of odd because, you know, she's a level five, so surely she went above expectations, but apparently not. Like we later learned that Meltdowner was was not even like the intended end result of what Mugano should have been, which is yeah. Kind of cool. We do get a lot of like Mugano lore in this volume. So if you're if you're really into Mugano's or what Mugano's backstory is, then I'm sure you will enjoy this. Yeah, uh, there's a actually, how come I hefty actually... reason? Yeah, like, there's just a pretty hefty reason. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right, sorry. Um, the way Kamachi is setting up Mugino's sort of like arc relating to her power in this book in particular, is really curious. Oh crap, my dog just scared me. Oh. Uh, because he, he's really start, starting to establish sort of a, uh, like the role her power plays in the background in these books. And it's also sort of establishing her own, like, uh, her own self-doubt, I guess. I can't think of another word for it. Uh, her own, like, doubt in her own abilities from here that I think plays long-term into her character development. What did you want to say, Matrix? Oh, I was just... I think I was pointing out something other than that. Oh, yeah. I was saying that there's actually a pretty hefty reason as to why she's calling her a failure that we will learn later on in Chapter 4, I think. Yeah, at the end of Chapter 4 in that fight. Yeah. And for just one other thing that I just noticed... I think I've noticed it before, but I just didn't make a mention of it before when I was reading, I think, New Testament. A lot of characters have unique speech patterns in this series. And yeah. I just wrote it down in my notes. Like, well, all right. A lot of people do. <laughs> I wrote yeah, down, if I were to have a nickel each time a character in Tuaru had a unique speech pattern, I would have too many nickels, to be honest. Yeah, well, I think that's like especially prevalent with Item in particular because ever since their debut, like Kinuhata and Frinda in particular, have always had a very distinct way of speaking. Um, and you get like the sisters and stuff, but I feel like we're seeing more of that with uh, the Item spinoff in general. Mm. Because Frinda uses in the end, in like every thing she says. Kinohara uses super, and Frenda's little sister, Premia, actually has a habit of using in the first place in every single sentence. So that's all right. Interesting. Anyways, moving on to Between the Lines 2, because I don't think there's really much else left in Chapter 1, right? Hmm. I, don't think I think so. it's worth noting that, that Carol gets Mugano's DNA. Oh, yeah. So that's important. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's not using the DNA to yeah. make Mugano clones as much as that would be a <laughs> ironic <laughs> plot point. The DNA map, as we know, <laughs> another level five has had that done to them. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's important for later on because obviously Carol has plans revolving around that. Not later. Uh, but yeah, if you want to talk about b Between the Lines, where we get to I guess, learn more oh, about yeah. their dynamic, I guess, or a little bit more. And we, we also find out that Mary has been like, like augmented, like her physical body 
Like, she's got, like, a shit ton of bones, and basically she can act, she can perform superhuman yeah. maneuvers and everything. So she's a lot physically stronger than, let's say, Mugano, who's an average human, about her power. Yep, she has about, what, how many bones? 500 and, 506 bones. And it's yeah. a process called, like, what, met... It's, it's like some process where uh, unnatural tissue transformation takes place. Something and they did her... point out. Oh, yeah, sorry. And, oh, no, I was just saying, like, that her muscle mass, like, all her muscle was also remade to match that skeleton. And mm. the wall, Kamachi also pointed out, like, how much of an expert she were because she made a human expert this way, but also made her beautiful. Just to just to flex, so I was like, "All mm. right then." Yeah, it does feel like their relationship is even at this stage is quite one-sided, but we don't know how mm. one-sided it actually is. Like, did it is it? Did they have an actual friendship or not friendship? But do both of them actually somewhat like each other? <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess they kind of do, but not in I a mean, way I mean, like, Mary, just, like, think. made that smoothie, or made that salad or whatever, and, like, sort of tried to act as, like, a big sister to, uh, Caroline. Yeah, that's what Caroline's missing, because we find out later on that she lost her big sister, tragically, mm -hmm. in an accident. So I guess that's why she's kind of, like, modeling... Mary to be like her, I guess, or well, she she actually models herself off off the fact that her sister, her old sister, was a Yaru. And wears her old her clothes. Own. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The bathing suit. So she's definitely got some like major attachment issues. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, I, actually, with Mary in general, I feel like her entire character like existed to sort of fake you out in a way because it like. My impression reading it early on was, okay, she's playing, like, a big sister role. Like, she's replacing Caroline's big sister. Um, yeah. And she's sort of, like, acting as the big sister guardian role. And I think that'll come important. And they make a big deal, like, oh, she's a murder virgin. And it's like, okay, so she's, like, she still has this innocence that you don't have with other Darksiders, right? So mm -hmm. my immediate thought at this point is, okay, maybe she'll end up being a character that will sort of allow Caroline to like find some level of closure and Mary herself will be able to return to the light. That's what I thought. Um, <laughs> early on, because I was like, uh, you know, she still has like a purity to her, like a good intentions almost. And then, well, yeah. We'll yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it does feel like somewhat like Harold is grooming Mary in a way, kind of upon later on. Yeah, it makes you feel like they're really close, though. Like, you get the yeah. idea, okay, they're, they're just going to be like, oh, if one dies, the other would be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> Only time will tell. Come on, she just has his way with his twists. What can I say? Let's move on to chapter two. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm just say... before then, I actually. Oh, go on. I just forgot to mention that there's actually is part seven where, uh, what's the voice on the phone's name? What was her Hanano. name? Harumi. Or Hanano. Hanano. Yeah. Yes. The... Yeah. She goes to a restaurant where other high-level dark side ex executives are talking, and yeah. this is where they talk about item and like, this was a proof of concept. And at the end of the discussion, she basically just thinks in her head that I bet those people have started a few teams of their own. So I was like, ah. So it wasn't that after Item succeeded, it was like some of the other Dark Side, High Dark Side executives started their own teams. So that was an in. Moving on to chapter two. Yes, this is probably my favorite chapter of the volume. I just really love the casino scene that happened later on, but we'll talk about. Uh, 
But yeah, they okay, go and visit. What's that? I said, okay, Hamazura. Why am I Hamazura? Because bunny suits. <laughs> hey, it wasn't because of the bunny suits. I swear. No, 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 no. You got the wrong idea. No, 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 no. It wasn't. I swear, honestly, it was because of like the vibe, and the bunny suit the is of, not the vibe. The of the vibe of the bunny suits. No, no, it was the dark side vibe. It was like the the underground like criminal espionage yeah, shit. Yeah, with all that, the I, and you know, suits. no, no, because you remember like from the from the previous volume where they you know stuck into that what was it? Yeah, the Coliseum company thing? building. No, 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 not the Coliseum. Oh, where the, Hanano, the, the, like, the, the yeah, yeah, it was, okay, like, yeah, it was like that, but but way cooler, more expanded. Yeah, with bunny suits. That's not the most important thing. I mean, Kamachi spent a long time on it. He even had to give a whole lore, like, oh, yeah, you know, there's a whole bunch of girls in bunny suits. You know, you got little elementary school girls, you got middle school For girls, sake. you got high school girls. Jesus fucking Christ, Kamachi. What is this guy on? <laughs> well, legit, it shows you why the dark side is fucked up. Like, that would not pass if it was a legal <laughs> casino. It wouldn't. Anyway. And apparently Kamachi just has an innate knowledge of casinos for some reason. He knows a lot about casinos in this section. Which and he funny. makes sure that you know it too. <laughs> All right. I, casinos in Japan are interesting because they're technically illegal, but they have like this very weird workarounds for them in which, oh, this building here is, the, is like, oh, you can go and get this special currency from here by playing gambling and then this building next door just so happens to release like uh accept that special currency for prizes or cash like that's how gambling in japan works because it's technically illegal to gamble for money yeah mm. right before we get to the casino can we talk about the build-up so Mugano goes and checks on the driver guy who got absolutely shafted. Oh yeah, like uh, was it Carol used her power on him and she like, like confused printed like an ad on his brain on a specific part of his brain or something and it's yeah. like shut it down. Yeah. What he did was actually he used like some method like it was I think it was like some iron like molten iron and she printed a, just a flyer just a random ass flyer from the street on the outer layer of the brain so that's what caused like the guy to like not you know and it jeopardized the blood flow and the oxygen flow that needed to go to the brain in those parts and he became unconscious during that whole chase sequence there in the first chapter, uh, it was in the first chapter. Yep, in the first chapter, that's what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah, it just shows you that there's multiple applications of this photography ability, and that it can actually like influence the electrons in the brain as well. And yeah, I think it's in like this. It's not like in a normal hospital, am I right? In this like weird dark side hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's in like a modified transport helicopter. Yep. What? Bro, I, when helicopter. I first read this, when I first read this, I was like, I am very, very curious about this. Like, how much? Give me a spin off right then and there. <laughs> like, <laughs> these are like military soldier like nuns having like, having like poison needle shotguns. At the bay, oh, yeah, yeah. and this is a oh, modified. Yeah. This is, yeah, and there's the, this modified like the truck cargo helicopter that houses all the medical equipment, and then there's the actual head nurse. I mean, the doctor that yeah. provides therapy to criminals on the dark net, and yeah. also this... helping criminals. <laughs> Yeah, this is something I want to talk about because this relates a lot to Heaven Cancellor, as he's pretty much referenced as this doctor has like a like a 
<laughs> she's described as really blouse, tight mini skirt, white coat, and glasses. She looked like she was cosplaying a lewd female doctor. Yeah. The nurse's outfits also the result of her taste. And he says, I left that man's hospital because I'm in it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> so that man has to, be, has to be heaven counselor. Yeah. So she used to work. She, she seems like a dark side heaven counselor because that's how, that's how she responds to like are you the kind of doctor who can't bear to abandon the patient so she's like the she's like the opposite or antithesis of uh, heaven counselor yeah. and I will it makes me wonder if her like nurses also used to work in the district 7 hospital because if you remember like when in index when heaven counselor got asked why do you work in this hospital he said it's because of the nurses <laughs> so I wonder, oh, yeah. I wonder if the, if these are some of the nurses he was referring to that have been shipped out <laughs> <laughs> that'd be some Maybe. crazy callback yeah i don't know because obviously that was kind of i think heaven counselor was kind of joking because he, he's obviously in district seven because alistair and Tomer are there of course but yeah it's still kind of mm, uh... chapter two yeah Kamachi again reiterates and mentions it because in the first part before Mugino and Frenda are going to the dark side hospital on top of a, a what 15 story apartment building or something Takitsubor and Kinohada are actually watching TV, and then there it is again, the freaking baseball tournament between two uh, high school... It was high schools? Yep. Two girls' high schools. And that becomes important later on. And there was another interesting tidbit that I found. Like, Takitsubo was talking with Kinohada, and Kinohada just mentioned, like, how powerful their opponent was and she was sh I think she was quite shaken from that instantly defeated and in the face of that Takisuba just calmly said they just took a advantage of the a blind spot but nothing else and she also pointed out a potential of Kinohara which I just thought oh wait Kinohara can do this I'll read the quote here Directly controlling ox and nitrogen means you have the possibility of tearing down one corner of the four bioelement cycle. That mm -hmm. means you could influence the entire cycle. In other words, you either directly or indirectly have the chance of becoming a queen who holds all life on Earth in her grasp. If a rare life form that doesn't need any of those four elements were to stand in your way, you could threaten the majority that are under your control to attack and eliminate that life form. And Kinohara points out, okay, that's just exaggeration. But Tagitsubo adds, that might be so, but that led me to think, wait a minute. That could be possible if Kinohara became a level 5 or something. Yeah, that, I, I just found that really interesting. Yeah, though I don't feel like Komachi's really considered having Tagitsubo go down that route versus a certain other member. Uh, yeah, it's more of just a, oh yeah, that maybe could happen in the future. Just pointing yeah. out Kinohara's potential. Nothing else. And, uh, oh yeah, just one other thing. They are in the blimp. <laughs> you know the Academy City blimp that displays all the news? Apparently it has a five-star like hotel and restaurant yeah. <laughs> hanging. <laughs> And they're using that as their hideout at the moment because their previous one oh, was destroyed. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a cool little detail. And because they couldn't really, like, because all of the other hotels and the normal hotels were booked because of the typhoon, so this was one of their only options left and Mugino was the <laughs> one who discovered this place. This stupidly expensive place. As Kinohara says. Yeah, that wouldn't feel safe if you're like in the middle of a storm. <laughs> like, you'd think it'd be like fucking cold off, but <laughs> there's no way that sounds safe. Well, well <laughs> yeah. it's just fiction. Academy City's text that advanced. That is 
fine. So, Mugano calls up her butler, Mujiniyama, and she's basically asking him for help, advice, anything. And it's revealed that she doesn't really like asking him for help or, or calling him. I guess she just likes to do stuff on her own about her family getting involved or whatever. Yeah. And apparently she... Apparently... He used to be a sniper. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he, he can get, like... A shit ton of, like, the Zinemugano... Like, Yakuza members or whatever. Well, Yeah. Well, yeah, it's stated that... Yeah, Muji Nayama, his name is. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or wrong. But he's called the Mountain sm Sniper. That's his code name or nickname or something. He can basically take aim like anywhere in the city outside from the walls and exactly hit his target. And I'm like, holy! Mugina got some really high level people to her side in her family. <laughs> and the only thing, like, the only reason Mugino refused it, it was stated in the novel, because she didn't want to burden the kind old butler's heart. And she didn't want to cause him trouble. So that was mm -hmm. like, ah, so Mugino cares for people other than item from her family. I guess that's obvious because that's her butler. Because I don't think Mugino's parents supported her that much. Was it stated somewhere? I guess um, I don't just, much about them. Just, yeah, I think Mugino just wants to be like independent in her own way but still sort of take part in that world i guess i i remember they yeah, talked about I it remember. in the first book i can't remember how that was exactly oh yeah, yeah now i remember it was stated in the first volume she was basically raised up like a criminal so this is like her natural habitat in the dark side in academy city yeah. So that was cool. And I want to see more of that butler. He seems nice. I remember he made an appearance in the uh, Railgun manga for like a panel. Wait, he did? Yeah, whenever uh, it shows the younger Lugino. In Railgun? Oh! Yeah, he had she had her butler next to her and he looked yeah. different. Yeah. It's like one of the, what do you call it, the art before you actually read the chapter where it shows like the chapter number. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Maybe I'll check yeah, out I've got a real somewhere. just for that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they, Mujiniyama basically says, oh yeah, the only way they would be able to spot your flat or apartment like, the people work for Carol would be in this specific position, in this specific shady-looking building. And then they get the, the security camera footage and they trace it back all the way to where they came from, which is District 22. And in this district, there's a shady underground casino that apparently owned by Carol on paper, I guess. So, the mission now is to infiltrate the casino, but who will do it? That's the question. Naturally, Brenda the wants one to do who it. looks best in a bunny girl outfit. <laughs> I, I, I wish it was Mugano. Right? That's what you would have wished, yeah. But no, not for Kamachi. So, Brenda wants to do it because... Brenda is very sociable and probably can talk to anyone and everyone. Uh, but it ends up being both of them in a way. But we think it's only Kino Hatter at first. Yeah. So Kino Hatter has to basically pretend to be someone she's not, like this all level zero girl who's trying to make some money quite smart and savvy with playing cards and shit. 
Yeah. Yeah. They mentioned despite what you, despite what you, uh, what spy movies have led you to believe, the trick to an infiltration job isn't earning everyone's trust. Or well, one that's simply not impossible. Uh, so it's more about being or trying to be authentic. I did like Henry's people. Uh, how they had her dislike when people made fun of movies being incorrect. Like, that was a regular thing with uh, Kinohara, is every time, like, she hates whenever people give those examples because she's such, like, a movie fan. Oh, yeah. And she hates people trying to point out what's wrong with the movies. It was a recurring gag throughout this book, which, I don't know, I like how... Uh, the movie thing is becoming like such a strong character point for her. It's like one of her few interests after escaping from that program. So she says that she's coming in for a job interview because she got recommended by some other dude and gets in and she has to basically hand over all the electronics so she can't have a phone and because she does it immediately like without hesitation or asking why they basically know that she's probably legit because yeah. usually the people who question it are the ones who who are like trying to get in who are like judgment members and we find one of those later on who unfortunately got caught and suffered quite considerably as a result but yeah this is basically i enjoyed this part of the, the chapter it's basically you know how to trying to bluff her way into getting this job as a yes malcolm a bunny girl waitress at a casino yeah <laughs> but but thing is the bunny girls do have a purpose as they are not only there to serve drinks they're basically there to be inconspicuous keep in an, terms of yeah yeah keep an eye out for cheaters and gather the trust of the clientele yeah yeah because because around them the people who you know go to the casino aren't going to be or well, might not be too self-conscious about what's around them in terms of the, the bunny girls maybe like the the security they'll be on edge and want to think twice about I would think twice about cheating, but with the bunny girls, they kind of like lower their guard. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of clever in a way. At least what I think. Yeah. This gives a justifiable reason as to why it has to be bunny, bunny girls specifically in the casino that does all that yeah. job. Which is like nice. All right, we have found oh, a useful bunny girl. Although <laughs> I do find it kind of ironic that they don't like, because obviously Kino had this quirk in her speech, is saying the word super, 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 all the time mm. because of the um, Doc May projects where she got accelerated speech patterns, but that kind of like went ape shit. I don't know, made her say super all the time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they don't. They don't. Like they don't really question. Like they don't really question, like, why, why are you saying super all the time? Because <laughs> surely, I don't know, that would be a bit kind of suspicious. Like, if, at least if someone came to that establishment for me and saying, like, super every sentence, I'd be like, what the fuck's up with you? <laughs> What's I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You didn't write I mean, any of the like a dark side of legal casino, and you find, like, a wide variety of people in the dark side so I think that's just yeah you kind of just accept things I like guess. that and people I guess they accept all the weird weird people she's like so now I need super money to super survive here in the city he's like I see oh <laughs> <laughs> uh... well, yeah she also does like this part of job interview is like her observing the cheating that he, the manager's doing. Mm -hmm. Just testing her to make sure she's got the skills for the job. Yeah. 
But yeah, she gets the job, obviously. And he says, don't you dare betray me. And she gets a betrayed. real... Gets a real handgun. And at a, casi at a casino, they also have, like, a murder team, which is, like, their security. <laughs> where they're literally ready to go to war if, like, some... Like <laughs> anti skill brigade raids the place, or if someone like tries to shoot up the place, or S for power or whatever. It's interesting. Yeah, they have the security team, and the murder team is actually different from them. They're also there to just show off, to like keep everyone in check so that nobody tries to do anything funny in the first place. But they also have the big guns on them. If, like, they're just in case for, like, emergencies. And I quickly wanted to point out a few things. This is the support organization that is running yep. the illegal casino. And it's not Mary. Because this support organization doesn't get paid. They have to sustain themselves. So they run this illegal casino to basically get all the money they need to support. Mary and uh, Anim. And uh, yeah, Frenda is helping her through the through the little uh, what's it called? The earphone? But like, the earpiece? What name? Wait, no. What is it? It's like behind yeah, it's the a, teeth. It's an earpiece. Oh, the, the... Yeah. Uh... yeah. It's just something is oh, yeah, it's behind her teeth where she basically yeah. just hears what Brenda is saying. And because it's like, it, Kamaji also made a point to explain because it's not transmitting like EM waves, the scanner didn't detect anything wrong with Kinohara as she was, and it was actually using something else. Was it like to un ultrasound waves? Yeah, but Kamaji okay. said it was ultrasound mm. waves or something else. Yeah. So that was cool. And all these job, all the questions that are being asked by the interviewer, she's answering them because Kinohara is just quickly telling her what to do. And Kinohara, Takitsubo, and Mugino are outside of the casino in a car. They, Mugino is doing the job of keeping up the scenario, basically writing down all the things and all the ad libs and all the scenario they they have created, so that when the time comes, they can just quickly retrieve the information because if anything is found suspicious, they will be eliminated really, really fast. Yeah. <laughs> I like how just Takitsu is doing nothing but just cheering on. That was cute. Hmm. Um, yeah, other we're already than that, almost two hours in, so we should probably yeah, speed run through speed some of it. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a long one. Yeah. <laughs> My days. Well, All right. fortunately, chapter four is super short. Yeah, that is true. Let's see what I did with there. with two. I want to mention bad. that the judgment girl that they find, and the manager says they need to dispose. Well, the the bunny girl should at least learn how to dispose of bodies of people who betray them. So this mm -hmm. judgment girl was meant to like investigate things, but obviously she screwed up massively. Yeah, and. You know, has this like kind of critical of that, like saying that no way you've been allowed to like be in here. The Judgment uh, Girl from the first book. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh damn, I didn't yeah, realize it was that. Mentioned. She was the Judgment Girl from the Coliseum. Yep. Ah, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I remember that, but I, I forgot there was a Judgment Girl in in the first volume. Uh. But yeah, th this is where it gets a bit... This is the one bit of the casino I was like, this seems... doesn't seem very well written. <laughs> this is where you know how to like fakes... Fakes her death burn by the bodies. Her yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so she's meant... To, so... They have like a crematorium in a way, or ovens, where they are meant to dispose of the bodies... So, Kinohata's plan is, okay, I'm going to 
get a lot of meat from the kitchen in this casino. And I'm going to burn that. And I'm also going to pull out her tooth of the girl to make it seem like, oh yeah, there are human remains that are left. So I don't suspect yes. that I've, you know, basically <laughs> let her go free uh, through this uh, tunnel exit. Uh, yeah. This this girl's also given her data on on basically everything there is about the Colosseum because she, she had hidden that. Uh, did she swallow it or something? Or... Yeah, she, she yeah. threw it up. Yeah. So, this is what I have. <laughs> this is my problem with it. So, how the fuck did she go all like to the kitchen, all the way to the kitchen? No one was apparently in it. Oh, no one is questioning the fact that she got all this fucking meat from the kitchen. And then she goes all the way back to where the fuck the judgment girl is in the, the cell, undetected. Are you fucking kidding me? Yes. Like, why are there, why are there <laughs> no what, chefs in the kitchen? How does no one spot her? Maybe raw meat's popular on the dark side. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... In her defense, the kitchen was just continuing on as usual, and because there was a certain level of noise, like just constant noise, like the clanging oh. of the utensils and all that stuff, no, and off, everybody was busy on. cooking. <laughs> fucking I know that sounds like really fun convenience, but like, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I don't what? know. Ask yeah, All fucking kitchens are noisy and busy. Like, come on, I don't care how small Kina Hatter is. Like, they're like, oh, what are you doing in there? Why are you getting the meat? Are you fucking hungry? Who are you feeding? Like, come on. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it's a fucking convenience. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is what I was talking about. This is why this volume is not as good as the first one for me. And the, we'll get, well, get on to the ending. I, I actually like the ending, just that the, the part of this is not great. Uh,. Lamar, super chat. Thank you. Uh, thanks for keeping up with a certain magical index. And of Horus, you are an abs. Oh, you are a boss in my eyes. Oh, very kind. I want to be an absolute boss. That'd be even better. But yeah, thank you. Appreciate the support. And of course, got to keep up with what's going on in the franchise. Anyway, turns out Brenda arrives in the casino in a bunny suit outfit and they managed to like find a blind spot where the cameras aren't there so he gets given a phone and everything to use like the, the data thing on so they can extract that data to find out where Carol is or what her next move is and they go absolutely berserk and shoot up the place which was fucking amazing <laughs> <laughs> this was absolutely bloodbath <laughs> what do you guys think of this scene um, it was, it, was, it was quite something. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And because, actually, this was, I think this is the first time we are seeing Kinohara take a stance on her morals. Because the Judgment Girl had helped them. So she thought it was fair to just eliminate the, all the dark side villains because everyone in that illegal casino be it the staff, the chef, the clients, and all of them are dark side villains. And because this is this, I think she, it, like it, it was explained, it was explained, like how Kinohara took a stance on her morals, and I really actually liked that. It was a, I think that was a nice character moment for Kinohara because, what well, it has been what, since only been one month since he joined Item, and before that she was in the Dark Me project. So most of her life, she's just been controlled by that project. And this is the first time that we actually see her taking that stance despite being influenced, you know, having those thought patterns of the number one implemented into her head. I thought that was a nice little thing with her character. So many elementary schoolers without jobs now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, and the scene, wow. Oh. That was nice. That was absolutely amazing. 
just they went full on Keanu Reeves on literally everyone in the casino. <laughs> <laughs> legit, legit. What in did you think, Mal? Just... <laughs> it was a oh, fun I scene. Mean. It was a nice. Uh... At that point, I'd felt like you know things had like slowed down a bit, so it was nice to get some like adrenaline pumping. Yeah. True, true. So, next they find out, well, they get a lead of what Carol and Mary are doing. They actually find out that Shokuho is doing a deal with them in the sta in a stadium that's, I think that's sporting event. I, I can't remember what sport it was or what the fuck they were doing. So, they're going to head over there to... Well, basically intercept them, find out what the fuck's going on. Hmm. Feel free to expand. So, when they were looking through in the phone, because, like, having, extracting all that data from the flash drive thing the Judgment Girl gave them, it showed the result that they're basically doing a deal with Shoko Misaki, where she joins... Honey Queen. Now that was a mm. twist. I mean, I actually saw the illustration before reading the volume, but still, when it was basically just put out in front of my face, I was like, all right then. I want to see where this is going. And mm -hmm. just a small thing that I wanted to mention, I found it funny. You know, when they were chasing out of the casino, uh, they were like a college age driver that was giving instructions, like she was pregnant and she was giving instructions to the AI to drive in a way, and I'm like, what? How the hell does that AI even understand what she's saying? <laughs> what the heck? How I refuse to believe that AI had can, like, be able to, like, understand commands like, oh yeah, just turn around and go full speed and like just turn this way or just put your strength into it and like some silly commands and like that i'm like nah nah mate this this is where i draw the line for academy city tech i don't know ai is pretty crazy if you've ever done any of the chat gpt like talking to it or anything sometimes it seems a little too human but i could imagine if you're academy city 20 to 30 years in the future the ai there would be like even crazier than that. I could see it <laughs> happening with AI or with Academy City Tech. Easy. Maybe. <laughs> Although all the other characters also pointed out that, yeah, this is like, I don't know even how the AI is understanding all those commands. <laughs> I found that was, I was just mainly mentioning it as a joke. <laughs> Anyways, to go ahead. So they, what do they do? Yeah, they go to the stadium. And after that, they try to search up the stadium. Like try to find because they don't know the exact location. They just know it's happening in the baseball. And this is the same stadium that the baseball tournament of the two high school, like girls high school. Yeah, the TV. As far as it's happening in. Yeah. So all four of them just go ahead and try to search up, but like try to search the place. But suddenly, Takitsubo calls Mugino and Mugino notices that something is weird. She looks at the center of the field and lo and behold, everyone is first peculiarity. Everyone is silent. Nobody's really reacting. And then second pe peculiarity, Shoko Misaki is right there in the middle of the field just pitching the ball and just doing whatever oh what no so how do you love for sports that should have been the first <laughs> <flag>. legit <laughs> legit so how did you two react to that like the first review looney tunes eyes flying out of my sockets I was like, damn, we are finally seeing, well, we're seeing Shogo versus Mugano. Like, what the fuck's going to happen? And I was like, oh my god, what? 
And I was I like, wait. Was I was very moving. curious, like, because every time it comes to, like, a level 5, it seems like, oh, Shokaho's power conveniently doesn't affect them. Like, oh, uh, Makoto has the electricity that keeps it from working, and Gunha just, I don't know, sheer tyranny of will just yeah. is able to break <laughs> from it. Gus! Um, and I can just assume that it wouldn't work on Accelerator for a billion reasons. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, Mugino is always, like, the only level 5. I was like, oh, could Shokoho actually do anything against them? So I was hoping to get my answer here. I used to sort of get half an answer, I guess. <laughs> yeah, because it, it kind of affects Mugino, but it doesn't at the same time. Which kind of yeah. But we kind of find out why, because it's... Yeah. Plot twist, it's not Shokoho! It's even it's better! It's you! <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> She's in everything now. Love her. She's the best. <laughs> Why is she helping Honey Queen? Well, I I guess she's just bored. She just, well, she said she's like... her goal is to make Shokaho Misaki look as bad as possible. That's oh, why she's yeah, doing yeah, all yeah. these bad things, losing her face. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yep. Remember. Yeah. Well, I guess that's something. <laughs> I, I don't know how effective that is you but you do you well, they i part of the reason they were able to figure out it wasn't shokaho was because of the lack of total control yeah that yeah like all the work around she had to do so do you think shokaho could control mugino because i sort of feel like she could uh, just based off how much au was able to do yeah well i mean while Mugino has technically got electric based ability, I think. Wait, she doesn't really have an electro barrier like this. Yeah. yeah, it's so maybe she'll have like small resistance to it, but yeah, but with this, like I mean if if like level three mental ability works on her to some extent, then I think five is gonna be, be like way too much. Yeah. Uh well yeah, who who wants to explain the actual quote unquote fight. I, I won't be able to do a good job, I don't think. Um, well, the Mitsuaku fight. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. Mugin just went out and, like, I think, uh, yeah, mit first Mitsuari Ayu notices that there are the, these four members that she didn't invite for, like, mm -hmm. the deal. And yeah, she just picks up and she's controlling all the base, like all the team members and the staff. So one of the team members just start coming up to Mugino and just, you know, start to try to hit her in any way they can. And Mugino dodges while at the same time, the silent majority of the 10,000 people just stares into her soul. Yeah, I and we find out later. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because... She does eventually sort of control Mugino. Mm. I thought it was interesting how Mugino almost interprets all instructions as somehow hurting Au. Yes. Like, oh, the best uh, way yes. to protect her is to put her in harm's way and get rid of the people behind her. And like, I it Wait, shows I how crooked Mugino's mind was, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the point. That that's what I was getting onto, I think, because maybe that's how it it can like <laughs> sometimes go against you in a way with a lower level less of power or something. Yeah. I interpreted it more as just Mugino being well, she's a criminal. You gotta remember. I have the court on hand. Fend okay. So she says to Mitsuri Ayu when she asks, okay, why are you targeting me? Friend is devious, so she'll probably hide behind the weakest looking person. So her most likely hiding spot is behind you. And your top priority is to protect me. And your second priority is revealing the item's location. Fine. 
the fastest way to do that is to beat you into a pulp and toss you out there as bait. Frenda, Kinohara, and Takiko are all very cautious. I don't want them disappearing and make this a long-term effort, so I need bait. So I need to bait the hook with the best bait available. <laughs> and then I'm like, <laughs> I was just laughing. I, I was congratulating Makino at the, the same time. I was like, I, I am, I'm just wow. Makino is this broken. Makes sense if you are in the dark side. Well, I guess this is just gonna happen mm. to you. Yeah. The methods to survive are extreme. Yeah, I suppose it does show it's not Mugino psyche. <laughs> but hey, yeah, we 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 then learn. Uh, yeah, but it's basically just a decoy by the main villains, and we learn that the main mm. the plots or the scheme of Carol, basically to make Mary into Mugino's replacement using Mugino's. De so, she wants to complete the research that she did. Uh, what well, we later learned. I can't remember if we learned that there and then, or it's in Chapter 3 where we find out what the perfect version of Mugino would have been. In terms of, it's more like manipulating electrons, because that's kind of how Meltdown functions. But mm -hmm. it's Mugino's power is just like pure destruction. It's quite basic in a way hmm. but this is far more complex using like electromagnetic waves and so we yeah this is part where yeah they go yes yes it is okay so between the lines uh they go into this convenience store yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah mary and, and uh and carol i i really enjoyed this this is quite entertaining because <laughs> there's this like grumpy worker and uh carol and mary are having none of it or carol is i guess no one wants to expand I mean, like, oh. the, the scene itself is mostly just... Uh, did it add anything? Like, did it progress the story in any way specifically? Or was it just sort of like a character, oh, look how messed up they are. They'll attack innocent, like, non-dark side. Yeah, I guess it just shows well, you how they would interact with with normal world, I suppose. Yeah. I yeah, guess, no. like, you get an idea what? of how, like, little they value, or at least uh, Caroline values life in that scene, and the levels of, like, manipulation she'll use and whatnot. It's, I guess, I guess it also shows, it furthers, like, the whole scam nature of her character, or, like, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I think this is a demonstration of her manipulative and deceptive side. Yeah. It expanded on their characters, but it wasn't really, like, important to the story. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, then we do learn about Mary's backstory. That she was basically this loner, bullied at school, but not too severe. Just that she kind of struggled to fit in, I guess. Mm -hmm. and basically Carol just gave her meaning and value like someone who saw yeah. something in her for whatever reason and it's described as someone who seemed to have stepped straight out of a manga so it's, yeah. it's clear that Carol is basically just Manipulating this poor lonely girl just to make her do whatever she wants because this is the this is the only person who will you know think of Mary as someone who's a word something in life I guess someone who yeah. actually sees something in her and that's why she he, gives her value 
like helping her. Yeah, that's her why Mary's so attached of, to her. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, I think we can move on to chapter three. I don't think there's anything else really in chapter two or from that segment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, apart from Carol. Line. Yeah, apart from Carol, uh, move... be... sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. I was just mentioning that th there was an interesting quote that when she was, because after, just after having heard uh, Tachio explain that she had a sister so bad, and well, I want, no, I want the two of you, and I, I want to ask the two of you, what did you guys think about it? Because at the time, Kamachi really made it, like, selling that Kamachi really tried to humanize the antagonist, and I was like, I was, I actually fell for it. So I wanted to know mm. the thoughts of you two. Um... I mean, I think Mary, it was like, okay, I can see what led her to this point. Um, and Caroline, it was like, I can see the motivation, but something's not clicking here. Hmm. That's sort of how I, what I thought whenever I read that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I I thought they were quite compelling antagonists. Uh, I like their dynamic. I think that was what the main thing I heard about it. And I guess, yeah, the relationship they had with each other, I felt, like you said, did make them quite human. Uh, or at least as human as they could be, because obviously they were both messed up in different ways reasons because mary felt more like a an artificial human that had lost her identity and become something else because carol had basically molded in her into what she wanted her to be and carol was basically just like just pretending or try, trying to be someone who she wasn't uh, either because like how she modeling herself after her sister which we do learn about in the between the lines as well how she lost her life and then that's what basically motivates her to find out what truly makes humans humans because clearly she's also like really dysfunctional in her brain clearly has some mental issues <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah she just boils down her motivation to be like she wants to find out, like, she wants to scientifically prove that heaven exists to prove that her sister actually went to heaven. That's basically her motivation. Yeah. And now we get on to chapter three. Yes, yes. All right, chapter three. This is where it got a bit weird for me. <laughs> I mean, a part of yeah. the volume were already weird, but the way they... Okay, so they, they like it invades or storm the fucking... Melt... So, all right. They need to go to Meltdown uh, Research Lab HQ. Yeah. Which is un underground. I think it's like underground, isn't it? In Academy City. And... Yeah. Um, Funnily enough, they reference like the the fucking particle accelerator under beneath like beneath the city, which I swear hasn't even been a plot point since like o OT nineteen, when like fucking spark <laughs> signal like captured some hostages down there. <laughs> that thing is kind of funny. I mean, I'm um, props on Kamachi for even like remembering it. Yeah, the hula hoop. Like yes, the hula hoop. hoop. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking hula hoop. Jesus, that's a callback. What better place to develop an electron beam level five? Touche. <laughs> quote from the. So novel. I guess he like had that thought out all the way from back then. I guess. You reckon he's planned it <laughs> from? At least all the way I can then? imagine like he at some point like whenever he's primary during his like preliminary drafts of like 
Mugino, he probably had some of this backstory stuff figured from the get-go. And then, like, oh, I'll just sprinkle this here, and then maybe someday it'll come into play some way. I could see mm -hmm. it sort of being like that. Because I'm sure he's thought out, like, oh, well, all these characters, like, the level fives are like, the most important characters, so I need to think about their development before I start writing them in so that I can sort of keep a character consistency around that. That's at least how I would assume he handles the writing process for that sort of thing. Hmm. Right. So this is where it got a bit weird for me. So this lab is like really heavily defended with like missiles and shit. And they mm -hmm. get like these water craft. I think because like is it flooded flooded because of the typhoon or is this actually like i don't remember there being like any sea in academy city or anything i think it's the typhoon yeah it's flooded, i think that's it? like yeah, yeah. he had to the place has... <laughs> yeah this is why it's, that's this is why it's a thing because i think him actually said in the in the afterward that he wanted there to be a scene with, like watercraft and i'm like all right <laughs> uh so Long story short, they managed to break in, of course, eventually. Oh wait, now I remember. Okay, uh, it's not the the what the what the hula hoop. Yeah, it's not underground. It's like it was like it was so like a previous facility was there. It's 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 kind of confusing. I even I don't remember clearly what happened, but like they went to another district to find the actual HQ. Because oh. it wasn't, yeah. They went to another district to find the actual HQ. That's from that's what I remember and wrote down in my notes. And be, and it was in a really inconspicuous location, just between two random skyscrapers. Hmm. And before that, Brenda prepared her massive. What was her just 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 her, yeah, just casually pulls out freaking eight thousand. Just casually pulls out rockets, and each of them contain one thousand bombs that she's gonna drop on that facility. And I'm like, "What the?" Hmm. Bruh. Into the inventor. Okay. I accept Academy City Bomber, but like, how does he even have that much material? And like, how is he you know, able to make that much? With that many the whole bombs, joke of, oh, them. where does Brenda put them? I'm not going to question it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just... It's one of the seven mysteries of Academy City at this point. Yeah. Yeah, and then... Yeah, then they attacked that. Because they knew it was... Oh, okay, okay, yeah. No. No. They are using UAVs to actually try to infiltrate the area of the facility and they are being shot down. And the UAVs are being controlled by Mugino and Takitsubo and Kinohara who are using just like a normal computer setup to control them. And they're trying to figure out the defenses of the HQ. And apparently it's a laser weapon. And after consulting with Frenda, it comes out to be like some modified, some SDI, some modified SDI. And Kamachi mentioned in the afterward that it was used in the Cold War or something. I guess. Yeah. All right. Nice detail. <clears throat> so they only, so Frenda only uses just enough to overwhelm the facility because originally she had 10,000 bombs that she could have used. But if she used those, the facility would have been obliterated. So she only used 8,000 to just have just enough time to make it into the facility and they are on the watercraft and oh boy here comes a scene that i was not expecting in a million years do you know what i'm talking about aeon is this after all during this is during like they're trying to approach they are on the watercrafts and they are trying to approach the building and then Takitsubo 
notices like two people stuck on a skyscraper. So she asks Mugino to hand her over uh, the the like yes, silencing yes. something. I know. And when now, Mugino yes. refuses, <laughs> Takitsubo just pulls out a gun and freaking pointed towards the back of Mugino, and I was like, <laughs> I was so surprised. I yes, I was yeah. I, that that also threw me off. I was like, whoa, what the fuck? Like I've never seen like. To Kitsubo ever stand up to Mugano like that? I was like, not not even stand up to her. Like fucking point a gun at her. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that scene also threw me off. I was like, holy Jesus. Okay, then we are getting some even more new characterizations for Takitsubo, huh? Yeah, it seems like their relationship is a lot more multi-layered than what initially appeared on the surface from there. You know. Debut in Index mm, and Rails. Yeah. Yes, but... that, and at this point, you just... can actually call Mugano out. <laughs> yeah. I think because in the first book, they sort of mentioned that Takatsubo is only. Uh, she, she's in the dark side specifically because of Mugino, and they had some sort of relationship prior to sort of item. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's actually called out here because Takitsubo was like one of the people who were falsely accused and had to go and end it up in the dark side because of it. That was the reason that Kamachi stated in one of the paragraphs, I don't remember what it was. And because of that, she just ended up with Mugino. And we learned through their conversation when Takitsubo is basically threatening Mugino with her words and the gun that okay I will read out the quote not really like I said I'm only your supporter my job is to do the things you can't so this isn't a betrayal deep down you want to do, do this too don't you you don't want to abandon those people in need even if it is meaningless and doesn't benefit us in the slightest because those people have nothing to do with our fight against Honey Queen and to that <laughs> Mugino just responds with a middle finger to Takitsubo. <laughs> Doesn't say anything, so she just proceeds to call the uh, emergency services to like, let them know about their location. Hmm. That was a really good scene, in my opinion. Yeah, I agreed, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I, for I forgot about that, not gonna lie, until you mentioned it. I was like... <laughs> uh, we do get another, like, brief cameo from Hanano. And also, fucking uh -huh. director N Nakimoto from the Accelerator manga also gets mentioned. Who was a known gourmet <laughs> and has inspired some unconfirmed rumors regarding can cannibalism. Okay. And more, more reasons to be concerned about that arc from the Accelerator manga. Uh, oh yeah, we also get Muba. Muba, not Uber. <laughs> fucking hell. So. I'm just like, please, come on, you please don't. Please don't make spin off yeah. somehow canon in the main series. I don't want that. Because You've oh, yeah, already made out. Silent Party canon, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> they have to reference the gourmet arc now, of all things, fuck's sake. So uh. when I read that, I was like, PTSD happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. but yeah, she's she's freaking out because it's gonna be a data breach probably because Mugano is gonna get the meltdown of data. But hey ho, they enter the facility and Mugano's like, "I'm home, bitches!" And <laughs> they for so, yeah, literally. Why do they have to do this? Okay, so one of them has to get naked to go into this fucking coolant tub because if they go in with clothes then they won't be able to go down to fucking activate this switch or whatever the fuck it is. Re rewire cables to get into the fucking data thing. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Literally this is just an it, excuse for wanting to get naked. It was just an excuse, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to go through that. 
<laughs> like literally. So it ends up being Takitsubo. Their turn. Yeah. It's just a comedy it a scene. It was just it, it was very much a like yeah. help uh the the what what is it called? Something before the storm. The calm before the storm. It helps sort of mm. take the tension off before it really like throws you into the rest of the book because from here on it's gonna be just more tense, like the yeah. stakes are all high and everything. Okay. Yep. Right. All right. I need to bring up something. So they get the they get the data thing and they find the folder. It's called Project Angelica. So this is Carol's plan to make the perfect version of Mugano, essentially, or yeah, an Esper with electron-based powers. And mm. they mentioned something very interesting about Project Angelica. So. Angelica. In the end, that reminds me of the word angelic, or maybe someone's name. Uh, I know there are people called Angela. It's a yeah. common practice to give a project a name that will send anyone investigating it down a dead end. In this case, similarly to the angel angelic, it's supposed to make you think there's something hidden behind it. And then this is in it italics. You mean the truly dangerous projects that are given easily mistaken names that would sound important to, to just about anyone. Now, is this a reference to fucking Project Dragon from OT15 that's, and 19? That's what I was thinking, actually. Yes, yes. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Because <laughs> when you think of Dragon, you think of like, oh, natural dragon. Not I was. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's probably one of like, the actual dangerous projects, but... Whether Iwaz does have a connection to the actual dragons in Toma, that's another story entirely. He might do because Toma's dragons have connection to AIM, which obviously Iwaz is the AIM god. <laughs> he literally <laughs> shits out AIM. Uh, <laughs> so that is an interesting. I don't know, I don't know what, to, what to call it. Tease, I guess. Yeah. We'll call it a tease. And also, oh yeah, mm. the occult is the perfect option in Academy City because it stands out so much. So he, he, just just rubbing more of that in to prove it's... <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a definite reference. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Project Angelica is creating the perfect electron microscope. So they can basically just rewrite DNA, essentially. They can just... Anything electron based, they can just like fucking do anything with it. So that's why Carol wants it. She basically wants to find out the secrets behind the human soul and if humans have a soul. So, she would, so by analyzing DNA with this perfect electron esper, she can discover the secret of life itself or whatever. So that's essentially the plan. That's what yeah, they were trying to make Mugano just... into. Hmm. It was mainly just gaining precise control over the electrons so they can just exactly and precisely take out those DNA, like parts of the DNA and insert them so they can mm. have basically full control over those DNAs and don't have to use other means that they use now where the success rate is not that good. And yes. the ultimate goal was to get us the... Uh, electron microscope and an electron scalpel to perform all the things they needed to do. And after that, uh, Carolyn's plan was to observe all the human cells and using the DNA, trying to find out any inconsistencies or just something that looks unnatural and follow that trail so that it could lead her to the human soul. That was basically her plan, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does also give me vibes of level 5 AM Stalker, or, you know, the, the Academy individual that Kitsubo is meant to be, as it also does mention that it can also rewrite the Esper tiering system in a similar way. But, ironically, I don't, yeah, Carol wasn't really aware of it, which is interesting. So it, it, yeah, this this electron esper does feel like an upgrade from like or 
or similar to to that. Maybe buff version because it can do other stuff as well, not just do with aim. And yeah, it is quite ironic that Takitsubo is the one, the MVP of this volume at the end to to come in clutch. <laughs> <laughs> like that that kind of person or similar person to what they wanted or what Carol wanted to create was actually did exist the entire time. So maybe that's the vibe they were gonna go going for this volume. Or at least Kamachi. Mm -hmm. Uh but yeah, Mary arrives and then Mary and Mugano fight. Mary is Kinda interesting as she uses like these fucking Chinese weapons and I could not visualize this to save my life because I don't know what any of these fucking weapons look like and I'm not gonna Google every oh, fucking yeah. weapon that's referenced. Uh but yeah that they're... Well they're not actual Chinese weapons, they're like it's so weird. She likes grabs like random shit and then beats some like Chinese weapons, but she doesn't know that they are actually Chinese weapons and yet fucking Brenda or someone is meant to like what, what? What the fuck is this fight? <laughs> Can someone explain this to me? I'm just like blabbering so, on. I'm, like grabs like wireless I'm, antennas I'm and suddenly they're these fucking Chinese weapons. Like fuck! What? What? What's going on? So see, and Mary has that improved body, right? And because Mary is supposed to be a more successful like creation than Magino, uh, Anim has. You know, AM Carolyn has implemented unconscious habits into her. Right. As a bonus. So, what happens is that whenever her body just instinctively pulls out, like, when in, whenever she needs a weapon, her body just in, in, intrinsically, oh, sorry, instinctively pulls out these metal scraps and turns them into weapons. And she doesn't know it herself that she's what these weapons are called. It's just habits that have been implemented into her. Right, I see. Still, it was it was really weird to like read. I, I could not like imagine it in my head. No, it's in a one where it'll be like, oh, okay, I want to see this in the manga. Uh, yes, nevertheless, I, I was just scrolling past all the Chinese names. I was like, nah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, Mary's power was, yeah, obviously it was electron based because she was. Carol was trying to make her into the perfect version of Mugano with the ele electron ability. But she, I think she could, like, send people or disrupt people's powers by using electrons in the brain or something like that. Grab it from wrong. Mm, that was about right, yeah. Yeah. I'm actually trying to look through all that to just see. Oh, Where this is my notes? Have I wrote it down? Right. Um, yeah. Nevertheless. What the hell is it? Yeah, I think that's likely it. I don't really remember Mary's power as well. Oh yeah, yeah. She says I already, I already broke down Mugano Shizori's brain chemicals using the electron beam I sent through her skull. So if she fires meltdown now, it'll only blow up on her face. Uh, but to kids about, she basically takes. I think she took body crystal, and so this has always been a thing where it's been implied. But this is the time we see it. Oh, I I, I can't remember if it yeah. has actually been used in this way. But like a aim stalker, it's it's been implied in the novels that it can like disrupt AM fields, and not it's not it's not just like the ultimate tracking ability, but it can also like send. Of Esper's A mark control, which then disrupts their ability. So this was implied in NT6. So if you haven't read New Testament, this might be a spoiler. But so when when K Kikina comes back, he think and like he gets overthrown by Beetle Five in his Dark Matter network because Beetle Five gains its own consciousness or conscience, and. Kikina thinks this is because of the influence of Takitsubo, who managed to like disrupt his aim field to make this actually happen. That was his theory anyway, but this is time we actually see this kind of thing in action. I mean, not just once either, we'll get onto that. But <laughs> so Takitsubo disrupts Mary's power, which is really handy. 
<laughs> and Mugano obviously melts out of her body. Nevertheless, Carol arrives and she says, Mary, thanks for everything, and kills her. Yeah. <laughs> Brutally. Mugano heard the yeah. awful sound of her brain flying. And it's like, damn, like, she was just disposable to Carol. Even though she wanted to groom her to be, like, the perfect version of Mugano, it seems like she can just, like, find some other lonely scrub off the street yeah. <laughs> to do it. I guess, like, in her mind, the fact that she lost meant shit that she wouldn't be capable of replacing Mugino. Or being, yeah. like, the proper Mugino. Which, like, this point, like... This fight, sort of like, even before this, I sort of like realized, ah, uh, she's gonna die here. Because up until this point, I was like, there's still this path where she like won't die and she'll get to like get out of it. Maybe like somebody will give her like a Toma talk or something. Um, just because like she hasn't yet crossed that line of like murder. Um, and Kamachi yeah. had used like murder virgin on a few occasions at this point. But then whenever she was like, oh, I'm finally going to lose my murder virginity and people will stop calling me that stupid nickname or whatever. <laughs> um, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, no, she's going to die now. Um, and yeah, I was just very surprised. Like, we because we finally see, yeah, Caroline has no, like, remorse because up to that point, like we were talking about earlier, it's sort of felt like she was like, oh, she's Caroline's older sister replacement, uh, as well as the Mugino replacement, and she's just supposed to be all these things. But in Caroline's eyes, it's all just useless and just easy to throw away. Which I think further sort of shows the way that she really thinks about her sister. Because the way she thinks about her sister, well, it's in the between the scenes or between the lines here, where it's more so of a uh, a cope, I guess. That mm. what she's doing has some sort of like bearing on, like, like there's some purpose to what she's doing. I don't know. It's really weird. Um, I don't know, Caroline's just like, she's messed up, man. True, she is messed up, and wow, yeah. You do, like, did you guys feel sorry for Mary? Obviously, she was very vulnerable. And... Yeah, I did. I mean, she, like, felt she was being bullied, and she hadn't yet crossed any, like, specific lines or like a point of no return and she was like emotionally manipulated by Caroline and felt needed for once yeah yeah I, I felt the same I was like ah well at least Kamachi is killing a few more characters <laughs> that yeah. was a bonus <laughs> yeah even the blonde and... ollies aren't safe in this book. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with the Between the Lines section, we do get like a insight into Caroline's psyche, which is appreciated because obviously without it, it's kind of hard to understand how her brain functions. And yeah, it's revealed that she, she basically scammed herself into like getting a graduating college and earning a doctorate at the age of five on paper. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Uh, but yeah, she only views things in uh, functions. That yeah. Everything is just materialistic to her in a way, which is yeah. why she wants to discover if there is a soul or not. And that, uh, yeah, everything is. It just, I, yeah, it's just kind of a cynical way to view the world. Yeah, you, she mentions a lot. I think 
the way she used her sister was like um in other words, it angered her as a researcher when someone refused to recognize the function she had created and built in her teammate. She had been a good person because she never deleted the photos of her sister's cheruban, right? She had been a good person because she wore her sister's suspenders, right? She had been a good person because she continued to fight a lonely battle for her sister, right? With functions like those, surely anyone would reach the same conclusion. Humans are a collection of functions. It, it seems like... I don't know how you would word this. It's such an interesting way for a character to sort of use a family member's death. Um, mm. Yeah, it's like she doesn't really view people as individuals, I guess. Yeah. Programmed. They're just programmed in a way that they'll think that about them actually thinking it it's such a hard way to explain it like it, it i feel like people who read the novel will get what i'm talking about or what we are trying to express but because it's like, explained in a quite complicated manner that it is kind of hard to express and it, like, it's even sense i know make caroline did not understand the formless concepts of the mind or a life so she so people's external outputs were everything to her so because her sister, my sister got up early every morning and made me Cherubon. She would like repeat over and over and over again. Um, and that was her entire definition of her sister. So that's how she like gave her sister value. And because her sister had value or something, that's how by remembering her sister or not for deleting the photo, wearing her suspenders, all that stuff it gave her value it's that's really hard to explain this character motivation <laughs> it is yeah. but I, it, it, well, I think trying to explain it it doesn't really it sounds like really convoluted and doesn't make any sense at all but I've, mm -hmm. when when i read it it like oh damn i kind of like understand this character's psyche even though it is quite complex like psychological programming that she has yeah to me she seems like if i were to put it she only look at anything she only looks at the output she doesn't look into the inside of that person like what's happening like mentally to them or like mm. inside them she only looks at the external output that the person produces and she sees each and every one of them as functions that they perform she doesn't really place any value in that per person itself. She only places value in the functions, quotations, yeah. that these people perform. It's sort of an egotistical thing, I think, because it's, okay, they output these things that affect me personally, and I am disappointed to lose the good functions that affect me. My sister was a good function, so, like, she is worth, like, remembering, right? But then, like, the things that do not output what she wants are worthless, and she she doesn't have value in them. I feel like it's sort of the direction Kamachi was sort of explaining oh, her yeah. moral, moral compass. I swear, oh, yeah, because man. She also, uh, because she also mentioned when, like, what reason do I have? Like, uh, Tachio Mary, like, didn't even stand a chance. Like, she said something along the lines of, like, she didn't last until she wanted to work more on the Project Angelica stuff, and that she, she she had lost the trust she put in the in the functions of Tachio Mary because she lost. So I think you're right, Malcolm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is hard to explain, but it's a very very interesting character motivation that I've never seen before. I swear. It's kind like, of like a mix it, of. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I Index is the only like series where we get like the most brain dead, like fucking <laughs> fan service typhoon, like <laughs> see through cloves, and then the ne next next like few pages, you get like some 
college level psychology Dream moral quandary <laughs> value yeah. versus output yep legit it's got like the most brain dead stuff and the most like giga brain stuff in one I guess that's what I guess that's how it can appeal to like people like in in both sides if you just like the brain dead shit or you like to be challenged intellectually mm. yeah the best of both worlds I say <laughs> what's up now, what's up moving <laughs> now moving on to chapter 4 which and I didn't know how short this chapter was going to be. Had I known this chapter was this short, I would have just finished the whole book in one day <laughs> rather than stopping after two and being like, I'll finish the rest tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this entire chapter was just like the fight between Mugano and Carol. What did you guys think of the fight? I thought it was... Oh, I preferred yeah. the fight, the final fight of the previous volume. It was a lot more tactical. This one, I mean, it had tactics to it because... As, uh, Carol was using like her ability and some like illusion type shit to throw off Mugano's aim, and she just could not like yeah. hit Carol for the life of her. And then it just comes down to oh, Takitsubo, use your aim stalker again to disrupt her power, and literally the same way to defeat Mary. Just like oh, that was really disappointing. At least for me, maybe it's I was like, Come meant on. to show Mugino slowly starting to create an over-reliance on aim stalker mm, i guess but it just seems like i don't know just seem, it just yeah, seemed very, it was... like creative like the, the final the final fight of the previous volume was like way more creative like in terms of like the environment and yeah how did like move from like from, and then getting like in terms of range yeah. and shit like it's more engaging for me i didn't feel the fights in this book were that great like yeah none, none of them like really stood out to me um that's why i think like chapter three and four are the weakest ones yeah i agree yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what did you think matrix of this fight it was I mean, it was it was a conclusion. It was a conclusion fight, but that that's all I can say. Fight of all time. <laughs> it's, 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 it doesn't say much, but it, 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 that kind of implies you you didn't think it was that great. It, I mean, it was a thing. <laughs> I mean, it was interesting, like how she used her power, and Magina has to try yeah. to figure out, okay, okay, what is. How exactly is she using her power and what's the trick to it? But that was a kind of a nice way to explain it to the reader. And the fight was... The fight was good enough for a fight. I don't really have much else to say, I think. At least Mugano removed her wet cardigan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though there was a risk of hypothermia, so there, there, there was a re... You know consequences for for the fan service yep well yeah um caroline was using like these blades as well in conjunction with with her power so that's why but she wasn't she was doing like a fucking bruce lee enter the dragon final fight i know this is kind of a weird niche reference but against what was he called han where he's just like fucking whenever he gets an opening he just scratches bruce lee instead of like fucking st sticking the fucking claw you know, in him, just slashing instead of actually yeah. putting that those blades into his actual fucking body, which would do way more damage. <laughs> it just feels like that. Uh, oh, I love that movie. Like, what is cheesy, but I don't care. <laughs> fucking amazing movie, yeah. one of my favorites. But, but yeah, it just feels kind of like that. Feels like, I mean, okay, she, I guess, typical villain playing around with her food. Not, yeah. Not <laughs> Uh, leaves it too late and then fuck you're dead you know, me Lolly, boom you're dead uh, Lolly dies. yeah, yeah. Lolly um deserved this time yeah even though i thought carol was a carol was a cool villain but ah uh, yeah i so, keep going back to item volume one like okay i mean i mean you, i forgot her name but the kaede she i don't think she was like the deepest villain but i, I liked her power and shit a lot more that was ayana etsu 
Oh yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I think the only thing that like I really took away was part four, um, where I think Kamachi is going for like setting up this sort of uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? He's like. She, she planted doubts in Mugino about her future development, right? Like, oh, Mugino, you're going to hit this, like, dead end. Um, you can't develop anymore. You're like, this is it for you. It's Jover. Um, which I feel like makes sense. Because like, like I was saying before, I feel like these books are sort of setting up Mugino to eventually like be the character she is by Battle Royale and being as unstable as she is at that point. Um, because here we're sort of seeing where she may be getting some of her like uh, inferiority complex, I guess. like. Like, she doesn't like Makoto being number three. Mugino thinks she's stronger than Makoto or whatever. Um, and we, we, we sort of see why she takes numbers seriously as her position of, like, number four and the desire to prove that she can beat someone higher. Um, I think it's even something you sort of see in the original story in the, the PSP fighting game. Um, uh, I, th this whole thing sort of feels like a setup for Mugino's character hmm. development. Yeah, it, it definitely felt like Mugino herself was, I know I said, Gets about was the MVP in terms of the person who kind of <laughs> well without without tickets about I think Mugano would have been fucked like massively. Yeah. So uh MVP in terms of the one who defeated well without her they wouldn't have defeated the villains. But Mugano, yeah definitely she was the the star obviously. I mean you kind of expect that from my item theories. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless I really enjoyed Friender and uh, Kino Hatter as well. There. Yeah. Side plot. But yeah, Mugano character. Character wise, she got the most depth and development, definitely, especially with the, the epilogue. Uh, I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, let's yeah, see what maybe. happened in the epilogue again. I sort of forgot. I know there's so, the, uh, the afterward, afterward, but what happened in the epilogue? I can't remember. Yeah, so. The epilogue? Okay, so vo the voice on the phone warns Mugino. This is a code that I just noted down in Notepad. You haven't made co direct contact yet, but you are getting too close for comfort. In our business, the most dangerous connections are the ones that just happen without you actually digging into whatever it is. You can feel the pull, can't you? The person at the center of the d diagram isn't you, it's probably the number six. If a villain comes in contact with the 6, they will die, even if they are at level 5. I've seen bits and pieces of a past few cases. The number 6 will deliver a finishing blow to the villain's life, even if it means shoving aside the invisible concepts we call save zones, causality, the order of events, and the system of God. You know how the dark side loves talking about unscientific things like luck and omens, right? I assume the hidden sign below the surface are far worse than the ones you can see. This felt like a really, really paragraph. Yes, foreshadowing. And I, I just noticed it also mentioned like he can overthrow the system of God. So that just makes him just even more hype. Yeah, that's because wild. I don't because I mean, when, typically, when one... whenever you mention, like, that particular line, like, overthrow the system of God, you think, like, the level six, like, reaching level six. 
rather than just mm. being like the number six. I don't know why, but I just related it to Toma for some reason. I don't know if that could be, and for, for just just a faint connection that maybe it's Ogami, <laughs> because if he can overturn the system of God, and Imagine Breaker does the same thing, and Ogami knows Toma. Yeah, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> <laughs> Ogami's <laughs> level or number six confirmed. <laughs> for real. But yeah, it's interesting that it just makes me more curious about the number six because how would, how why would it affect villains and no one else? I guess because Ihan has a vendetta against villains for whatever reason. But, but even a level five, it says so. What would happen if Ihan had met Dolorator? Well, apparently mm. Ihan was present like at the lab six months before. Mary got, not Mary, Carol got booted from it, something, I don't know. Oh, yeah, wait, wait yeah, yeah, let me just, speak my neck. I think the voice on the phone also mentioned, what was it, can kill, can you get yourself killed, easily? Yeah, the voice on the phone also mentioned that he was involved in getting I, like, I named Carolyn out of the lab because... Mm. Nobody in the lab can really kick her out. She's the head researcher, and on top of that, nobody's really capable of kicking, kicking her out of the lab. And the voice on the phone mentioned something along the lines of, yeah, she was in, uh, like, Aihana Etsu was involved in kicking the head researcher out of the lab six months ago. So that's like, mm. I see. So he's getting more and more heavily involved as the item volume novels go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about the ending because, as I mentioned before, like the link between the Angelica ability and the kids of Bo's final academy of ind individual ability, it is mentioned. It's kind of like uh, Hanano's talking to someone, I think, or is it, or is it someone else? I don't know. Uh, actually, I don't think it is Hanano. I'm not sure who's talking at the end there. I think it's... Wait, at the end of but, the yeah. epilogue or at the ending? Ending, ending. Oh, the ending, the, okay. The ending. Okay, okay, okay. Characters yeah, talking, is characters talking at the start. Yeah, because they mentioned that it's kind of similar to Shokoho and AU, right? Okay, Why? okay, yeah, yeah. Um. So, yeah. I guess... I guess they were both like tr trying to plan which one of those abilities would end up being like the next level five Esper, or the one that can re replace the system of Academy City. It was like competition mm -hmm. between two of them, kind of like Shokoho and AU. Yep. And apparently, Alistair agrees to continue the monitoring item see what happens with the two of them that, that, that is the goal was to... this was the bold this was one of the board of directors right no no no, no. It's, it's, they, they say that and the city's king agrees with me as well oh, oh, oh says, i line, can get yeah. a majority of the 12 on my side which is board directors and the city's king so okay, yes okay. it's alistair as well I mean, yeah. yeah, that would be really, really convenient for Alistair's plan if he could just create level fives like they're nothing. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if that ever happens in GT. Because, yeah. I mean, the science side desperately need, like, a fucking buff. And I think if you can, like, yeah. fucking <laughs> make as many level fives as possible to, like, compete with, like, the Transcendence, then that would be huge. I mean, Target Subo is just an interesting character that like after world war three they just sort of abandoned setting her up i mean like like what in the ot 22 i think they called her the eighth whatever yeah yeah um, academy individual yeah. yeah yeah um 
it feels like it's been a long time coming. She was set up to like do something big, and then it was sort of just kamachied and put to the side. Um, so I'm wondering if this is him like, oh, remember all this about Taketsubo? Remember how she's important? Hint, hint, GT. Gotta reestablish <laughs> stuff so that it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the ending. So that I like this Japanese festival, culture festival. In the yeah, the fireworks batters. festival. I mean, I, I just, yeah. in my mind, it's just a headcanon in my mind. Yeah, it's the fireworks festival because, of course, it is. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone's there. You got like Premia and Azumi, who's also fucking minor character from NT. And I don't know if, if it's Kanu Shinka there as well. I'm not sure. But probably. Uh, yeah. Everyone's there. Anyway, Frenda and Mugano have a moment. So. Mugano is weirdly kind of feeling somewhat regret because while she does have like the data to behind her power now, like she can't do anything with it because she needs she needed Carol's knowledge for that to be able to like enter the next stage of development or know what it is to do to closer to the final well intended stage of her power. So So she's kind of conflicted about that because she feels like okay, she said what, what what did i do to deserve have my future stolen from me so it's, even though she's level five i guess she wanted more than that she she just wanted to be the best version of herself in a way and i guess she was just spiteful at harold because harold didn't believe in her that she was capable of doing that. So I guess that kind of explains the From... vendetta that she had, maybe. From what Mugina mentioned, it specifically stated that she has all the data on the equipment and also the knowledge. Yeah. It's just that anything that needs to be happened, they have to take the permission of the adults. And even though she has all the necessary things, the adults have denied her request. And the adults have basically denied her and shut down that HQ. They did not rebuild it, which meant they have basically abandoned her. And I interpreted, like, Mugino being this conflicted and angry and also really sad about it, more of a thing that's unique to Academy City. Even though you are a level 5, Academy City can be really, really unstable at times. You don't know when you're going to die, especially in the dark side. And being just cut off from the entire system, I think it's a problem unique to Academy City that if that happens to you, that basically guarantees that you are not having, like, getting a lifeline any, like, lifeline anymore. And you will be in much, much greater danger from now on. You can be easily replaced, yeah. And I also take it as a sign of you can be easily replaced if someone like you also happens to come up in the future. That was my interpretation. Hmm, yeah, I guess because just mentioned that. Yeah, it does feel like the uh, future is locked away because the city is basically like just taking all her op opportunities away. Can't really go back, I guess, to what normal life would be like in the city. Another, I, I wouldn't know if she would, that, but I guess for the opportunity it would bring to her. I don't know. But this is where it ends, because <laughs> oh god, they just love referencing or teasing. The future with Brenda Mugino. Yeah. She leaned towards yep. Mugino's ear and she said something she never should have. She spoke the faithful words that could become one of many factors down the line. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> In the end, I swear I will never betray you. And then the volume ends. So, 
<laughs> Brenda promised to Mugano that she never betray her, and this is why Mugano gets it. Well, Mugano is already like stated to be extra salty, like about betrayal. She really fucking hates it more than anything, mm -hmm. even though she's like Ali with her item groupies. Not only that, but Brenda also promises that she'll never betray Mugano. Well, I'm sure Malcolm has something to say about this. <laughs> Ah, <sighs> <Yeah>. go on. <laughs> you, 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 you like the friend of betrayal, so I'm sure. I, I am curious if Kamachi is going to intends on using the manga version of the betrayal, in which like Measure Heart was used in order to get Frenda to to, you know, spill. Um, and I, I like the ending a lot because I feel like we're setting up everything to make sense from to Boogie No being as extreme as she was and like, you know, going as far as she did. Cause like the thing I didn't like in volume one was like it was like everyone was too close and i kept thinking like you know if this mugino were to be like quote unquote betrayed by frinda during like battle royale it doesn't feel like she would have gone to just straight up killing frinda right off the bat right mm -hmm. um and she she felt too like trusting to the point where she would be like oh something is up um, I don't know, I, I'm fairly confident this is just, just like I've said a few times already, this is Kamachi set up to write Mugino as the character she'll be by Battle Royale. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely a journey and I'm like curious where She's going to end up after this next volume. Definitely excited to see what they're going to do. Because obviously, we might see more about Ihon Etsu, which is exciting. Possibly more about the 8th level vibe that they were trying to create. Said so Mugen. Mm. Continuing to develop. Which. Now, do you. Do you feel how much more do you feel like they can do with uh, the item cross or the not cross uh, the item spinoff? Do you feel like it can keep going like it is, or do you feel like there's a in, a clear ending in sight? Oh, I don't, I don't think it'll have as many volumes as let's say OT. <laughs> I think, oh, right. it, yeah, I don't know, probably. I'd be pretty content with it finishing around like volume nine, ten, maybe. I feel like there's mm. there could be these amount of stories to tell. It really depends. Like, okay, if it if they just keep adding like, okay, villain, science side villain of the week, it's like a bit far fetched because like, come on, how many fucking I, <laughs> power, yeah, overpowered I, I, science side villains are there in the city? <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of like on the camp of like having it end off in maybe like a trilogy because. I think if you keep going for too long, like you have to keep developing the characters book to book and you run the risk of overdeveloping them mm. before they reach the point of canon or like not canon, well, the point of OT or like um, at some point, if we keep going too far, we're going to have to write all the characters into like this like static they're all just going to become very static at some point if it goes on for too long. Um, which is something I feel like we've seen happen with uh, uh, the Railgun manga um, to the point where it's like, oh, let's have a flashback and now Makoto, we're going to give you a whole backstory of how Makoto has a personality. She stole it all from this girl. Like, it keeps going until they like jump a shark. That's just. Mm. True. So, what what are we all gonna rate the volume? I think I gave it a seven point five on Twitter out of ten. Uh, but 
what would you guys rate it? Uh, probably a seven. Hmm. <clears throat> For me, well, I didn't really answer the two previous questions. As for how what I, mean, I thought about last, <laughs> yeah, I just thought this was a brilliant scene. Like he just twisted the blade deep in the heart. He just loves this stuff, like future all the future references. So I was like, this scene was brilliant, and especially because Magina was crying the entire time uh, on Frenda on Frenda's chest as she was spewing out everything she could because she couldn't really stop herself all the things that she had kept under wraps just continued to flow out with no end and this is the most vulnerable Magino is ever and at this point if Frenda had made that promise oh boy it's gonna leave a great great impact on her because in the mo in her most this is the most unstable state we have seen Mugino in I mean other than the battle royale stuff of of course and Frenda just made a really hefty promise and if she betrays it well <laughs> we know she does be it involuntarily but still yeah I think <laughs> this already makes sense as to why Mugino did what she did. And as for the point, as for the question of how many volumes this should have, I also feel I am also on the same side. Like, 10 volumes are enough, and as it's called a certain Dark Sides item, I presume that Kamachi is going to, like, have a couple more volumes where he's going to try to explore different Dark Side things and themes inside of Academy City and using item as a platform almost to just reach out to every other theme there is and they could explore in the dark side of academy city and also i feel like some more development is surely needed to get to the point where Mugini is so unstable that she's just gonna cl kill frenda and all the other mm. characterizations and for takitsubo and i agree with all that you guys mentioned before on Takitsubo being the Academy City individual and learning more about her power and what she can do. Like in more extreme circumstances or certain situations. And yeah, that's about it. As for my rating, well, just because of the murder twins, Mama or Papa, and that it just went up to 8.5. Just kidding, it's still 8. Alright, fair. Yeah, I just thought this volume was a great follow-up to the first one, and uh, it had some amazing scenes. Alrighty. We are finally at the end. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we made it, guys. Yeah, Three hours fair. long it for finished. item volume two. Jesus, imagine if it was... Imagine if this was New Testament 22. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> wow, good job I wasn't I doing the podcast back then. <laughs> but there was a lot yeah, of talk about this there was a lot of talk about this volume yeah, yeah a lot of lore a lot of references a lot of wacky scenes so this volume definitely had everything but I feel like they had, did have a decent amount of flaws that maybe, like, I thought it was a good follow up but yeah it wasn't as, as good as the first volume in my opinion I enjoyed it way more yeah, nevertheless Q&A time so I know You're there's been some people here. who have Yes, we're finally here. So I know there's been some people in the chat who have been trying to ask questions, but yeah, remember, we usually do Q&A at the end, but obviously feel free to send any super chats. That's always appreciated. Thank you for the support as always. But yeah, send your questions in to the chat and we will get to them when we can. And obviously, one question per person. I'm, I know people, not everyone does it, but some people do it. They ask like three questions or five questions. One question, please, to make it fair. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll, we'll be here for all day, which might be entertaining for you guys, but, but we, we I need to sleep. Sleep's important. Don't want to torture me. Yeah. Well, I know I know there were some earlier questions, so I'll try to go back to that. 
while the new commenters or people in the chat will send in yeah the, the live chat only brings me up to a certain point so, also shout out to the channel members in the chat. Void Hero. Delta 99 report card. Gig. Of course. Right, so anyway. Okay, where are we at? Where are we? Okay, Depths Rue or Row. A question. Who can kill Accelerator? He has a shield which can reflect everything I can think of. I mean... <laughs> In, in, There's a in Tsuaru, number of magic side people. Who, yeah, well, I mean, the, theoretically, up to a point, can kill him. I mean, his main weakness without, is that he can't he can't breathe oxygen. Yeah, um, and there's certain powers where he's like uncertain, like uh, Cindrillin. Whenever he first fought her, and he was scared to like approach her because he had no idea if his ability could even reflect. Her, like yeah. foot magic stuff yeah literally i mean it, yeah if you, you can't breathe uh, unless oxygen's there then you could just like fucking then it's the space like destroy the planet yeah theoretically I mean, any, any magic... style could beat him because fire destroys or like you know uses oxygen so you could Create an area with no oxygen using fire. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean one of the sisters tried to. Yeah, I mean, one of the sisters, I think, tries to, like, remove the oxygen in the air to beat him, but obviously that didn't work. Yeah. Well, they, that was the 10,032 whenever they were destroying or uh, turning the oxygen into atmosphere or whatever. Um, yeah. During that fight. Yeah, but, you know, style has the advantage of runes, mm -hmm. making him sort of hard to get rid of the fire. Hmm. Well, yeah, anyone with like conceptual manipulation or can, yeah, magic gods, reality warp, yeah, yeah. Just, magic gods just reality warp on a universal scale or multiversal if you want to count all infinite phases. So there's nothing really can do. Do with that, even in his, you know, strongest form, at least as far as we know. And then his, like, Katana original can even kill him as long as it is the right spot. In yeah, his so yeah, we saw that fight in, in T22R. Yeah. And he managed to hold out, so. Yeah, and plus, like, even, like, strongest accelerator in, in the novels. He's only really shaking a galaxy. Uh, I mean, he could be a lot stronger than that. Mm -hmm. I know his vector shield is reflected like way stronger shit than that, but like, how is he meant to like harm multi-dimensional beings that are like beyond existence? I don't think he can. Well, you see, his uh, the teleportation index uses eleventh dimensional theory, and he's able oh. to reflect teleportation. Therefore, yeah. he can attack through dimensions. Okay, you, you reflected magic flaming sword, but that's like. Magic Flaming Sword is a lot... I mean, it's it's powerful, but only... Like, the scale is a lot smaller than, let's say, Gungnir, which can affect the entire fucking multiverse. It only affects, like, one target. No, it's not like it, it goes off and then destroys the universe. It only affects, like, one one thing. One small thing. But it does, like, yeah, but can go damage on that same level. If I'm explaining that right. Anyway... No, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Dario, is there anything else Mugano can do except for shooting laser beams? I mean, laser beam is a gimmick. And it's not just like... It's electron beams that is neither particle or a wave. Which can yeah, draw shit. We have already seen what she can do in Volume 1. Yeah. Change the atomic composition of targets. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, yeah. 
Visions of a Lost Horizon, Tuaru Index PSP PvP gameplay in the background when? I don't think that would suit a podcast that's kind of distracting. <laughs> Just want the chill yeah. vibe of Enemy City background. No, hey, it's Renzix! While we talk. Renzix, welcome! It's nice to see you in the Hello. chat. Hello. It's the 23rd podcast already. I still remember the first one like it was yesterday. Oh, thank you for tuning in again. It's always a pleasure to see you in the chat. Hope you're doing well. Always free to talk if you. Uh, do, 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 do. Dekamaru, hello. I apologize if it's against the rules or not. Thing you would answer dreaming, but I have to ask: Could Kuroko be accelerated by teleporting a metal rod in his head? I wouldn't know if this has already been answered. I don't watch the anime. So, I think someone else said. I don't think Kuroko could do that. Her teleportation ability does, don't work like that. Uh, that. That's that's false. Kuroko can definitely teleport objects inside of people's bodies. I mean, she, she teleports like fucking needles inside people's clothes and bodies when she's down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the only way it could work is if Accelerator's choker isn't active. So his ability, you know, his passive reflector shield isn't active. Then yeah. obviously that will work because his power's not engaged. But. As Malcolm said earlier, 11th dimensional calculations, so teleportation vectors use 11D calculations as well as accelerator, so yeah, it's stated he can, he's basically immune to teleportation, or, or at least Kuroko no Waki's teleportation, because thanks to the accelerator manga and anime, <laughs> that got retconned, <laughs> you know, this port's fucked that fucking S with power, which makes no sense, that is, that's, that's bullshit. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, yeah, she won't be able to teleport anything. Back to shield covers that. So yeah, no, that answers your question. Oh, it's called ass port. Sorry, not not this port. It, I, I think it is an ass port because it's a fucking ass pull because he shouldn't be able to be affected by any tele teleportation ability. But thank you, Accelerator Manga, for changing that. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, where are we at now? Oh, Evolution GG Vegito! Thank you for the super chat. And there's no message attached, but appreciate the support as always. Hey, nice. Thank you. Uh, Alright, where are we now? People discussing. Uh... Okay. I think we're. We are nearly up to date. DM44 asks... Am I, is that the nearest one? I think it is, yeah. DM44, does Saturn find out who killed Frenda? No, as far as we... Nope. Well, maybe one day, we don't know. Probably not, because she's not in the dark side, so she won't probably find out. Prince Manic, who do you think... Who do you guys think will be the first level six? It's a trick question. What do you mean it's a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I mean, you, you think it's going to be someone else over an accelerator? Is fucking Kikina, Dark Matter, like, network going to come back? I don't count Beatles 5. Mean, come on, it's man. Gunhard, though. Oh, we already okay. know that like, Gunhard and Ayana Etsu are the first candidates to become level 6. Oh, uh, yeah, alright, okay. It's going to be Toma. <laughs> I mean, He's look at Accelerator. He's already got fucking Platinum like, Wings. He's already. Sorry? It's gonna be Toma. His, he reaches level 6 when his right arm gets cut off. Right. Oh, yeah, it's like the fucking guy in the... I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call his, his username out, but the guy who thinks that. Toma confirms... Uh, has an Esper power confirmed. <laughs> he He's convinced that it's not a theory and it's canon. And from some, like, implications in NT22R, he's like... Oh yeah, that's Thomas S for power. A and T is Thomas S for power. Even though that was like, I mean, it's never explicitly stated. It's, you could you could gather that from what we were told, I guess. But it's... it seemed more like a consciousness of its own, formed by like a Madden Breaker or something. It's... Yeah, but he he, he yeah. says it because it's because K and T had like the Kazakiri cube or sphere thing inside it. He said that's. 
Because it's AIM. Well, even if it is AIM, that doesn't mean it's his Esper power. Literally, why, why would his fucking... Why would his Esper power be in his, inside his fucking right arm? And that he, he needs to <laughs> fucking burst from using it. That's fucking stupid. And the only way it burst from using it was from Imagine Breaker, right? So... Whatever. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Accelerator, probably, most likely. I mean, he's got fucking lots of wings, which Iwas has. And Misaka 5.3 was stated to look like Iwas, so it's, Iwas seems like the natural end point or something equivalent to that for, like, level 6. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Right, uh, next question. Taco Lex. Has Mugano popularity greatly increased since the novel releases? Odd that I've noticed. I mean, she's always been liked. Apart from the people who love Frenda more than anything. <laughs> they don't like her. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's about the same. What about you guys? Uh, Repeat the question something? again. One more time. Has Mugano's popularity greatly increased since the novel released? Um, well, yeah, because off. whenever uh, the Battle Royale arc came out, um, her popularity went from zero to existing. Because <laughs> that was her first appearance. Yeah, she yeah, well. Yet. Well, uh, well mm -hmm. unless we talk about the anime, which is most, what most people watch. Or consume, I should say. Well, they asked about the novels, didn't they? Since the novel releases, yeah. Well, I I think oh, okay. well, I think they're referring to the item novel. Oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, she's more popular now. Railgun made her popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I always, I don't. I haven't seen any like massive spike. Of, I mean, people who simp over her still simp over her. I haven't seen more people simping over her than usual. <laughs> what about you, Matrix? Have you seen a? Surge in Mugano popularity since her spin off has been around. I don't think, think Mugano is just the same as ever. Maybe more people like her now because of the item volume. And I see more art on of Mugino on Twitter, but nah, not, not really a surge in popularity. I would say she's beginning to be more liked by other people if they actually read the item spin off. Yeah. Right, Zekamaru. Did we answer a question from him already, or her? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah. Well, did you well, do it's, it's basically the same question or? anyway, because it's like, can Kuroko teleport objects into oh, yeah. his head? We already answered that. <laughs> no, she cannot if it's active. Uh, Sebastian Ribiri. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, when are you going to play Toaru Nimit? Listen. I uh, honestly, that is that the Mugen one, or is it? I think that's the Mugen one. I'd have to download yep. it and everything. <laughs> I'm a busy man. What can I say? Maybe one he day. He retired after becoming the best Aqua player in the world. <laughs> that's for PSP. Yeah. I, I I don't know if that's for, I, I don't know if Tournament is uh, PSP or or the Mugen one. I, I don't. Uh, it's the moving yeah. one. Oh, is it? Yeah. Honestly, if I was if I was to play it, I'd probably play Laura or Coronzon. But if Alistair gets added to it, then yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be there day one. Or like a fucking... Uh, well, it'd be hard to make a an Alistair mod of Coronzon in the game because he needs a long hair for her to work. <laughs> when Al Ali Zon has very short hair, so maybe one well, day. For I don't the, know, just for the Alistair getting added into the Tomorrow Mugen, don't worry, it's coming in about two or three years. Well, I'll still be, be an index fan by then. then. Okay, Void Hero. I nice see you here. Do you think level 6 is close in practice to Magic God, like science equivalent? Yeah, I think so. It's yeah. pretty much been implied that from like uh, OT3. From yeah. my in, in, index gets explained system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she says it's similar to Ein Sof, which is like 
the fucking territory of God, like, beyond, mm -hmm. like, Kefa, whatever. So, yeah, I'd say so. Uh, Matrix, what do you think? Yeah. I think that's the same. It's a close equivalent, but I can't, I just can't see it be. It's just a close equivalent. That's it. It's in the sentence. It will never be an equal to a magic god. It will just always remain a close equivalent. Okay. I don't see any more questions. What about you guys? Have I missed any? Um, nope. I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Hey, then we made it. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the podcast, as always. And make sure you like the video. That would be appreciated. And also, check out Matrix's content in the descriptions. I've linked both of his accounts. But to, Ar to Aru Endorser and his other YouTube as well as Twitter accounts. So make sure you drop Matrix uh, a follow, subscribe, and all that good stuff. But yeah, thanks for coming on, Matrix. It's been really good having you on, and I'm glad your notes were super useful and in-depth. Yeah, I just have a habit of just writing in detail. I guess it's just something I always love to do. I was, yeah, it was a great honor and amazing to be here as well. If I can have any more opportunities, I would love to be back. Well, if you stay up to date with Item, I think you've got a good chance. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. By the way, guys, if you haven't read Item yet and you just want, came here for spoilers, make sure you check it out because it is. I know we kind of rinsed on it a bit in this this podcast for this volume, but I definitely, yes, we all definitely recommend uh, people check it out. Cause I don't think many people are. It's kind of shame, really, because I thought the volume one was strong start. Do you have any last words, Mel? Um, no. Thank you for coming and watching, everybody. I'm glad you all stuck it through with us till the end. Make sure you check out Item. Yes. All righty then. I'll answer a quick question for Prince Manic. Would Item be worse if read before NT? Uh, maybe slightly because you won't get some of the references, but it will. It shouldn't impact it too much. There's just some, like, character moments. Like, cameos you won't fully appreciate. But yeah. You, could. you have to read through GT if you want to appreciate, like, the cam a lot of the cameos and smaller details, mm. but you can start it really as soon as you finish Battle Royale. Gotta go on the grind. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Hope you all have an awesome rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. And see you all next time.